things. So I believe we have a quorum. We're all in attendance. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance by our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Christopher Henson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's been another rough couple of weeks since we last spoke, but there are a number of things to celebrate as well. With that, we'll move on to director's report. We're going a bit out of order because we have students, we have parents here who, uh, who we'll hear discussion from. So, Dr. Battle? Thank you so much, Chair Bugs and board members. Today, we wanted to continue our conversation we started at our launch this afternoon of the central office as a support hub. One of our core tenants of the district and one of our 14 signature initiatives we have put into place that will help us to achieve focused outcomes for our students and help us truly reach our North Star of being the premier large school district in Tennessee and beyond. Before Dr. Barnes starts his presentation on the Support Hub initiative, I do want to first thank, give a shout out to our Promise and Scholars team for the incredible work that is being done to put together a comprehensive summer learning program for all of our students at no cost to families. <laughs> we have had such a great response so far from families and staff who want to participate with nearly 9,700 students already signed up. I want to recognize that the United States Department of Education is so impressed with this effort that they highlighted it in their newsletter that went out to educators all across the nation. All right, now. Woo, 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 woo. As a reminder for families watching and who may be here tonight, the deadline to apply for the Promise and Scholars Summer Program is May 5th. And we want everyone who is interested to visit summer.mnps.org to learn more and sign up today. Now I'd like to kick it over to Dr. Barnes, who will share more about our efforts to re-envision central office as a phrase I will try not to say ever again, but as a school support hub. Dr. Barnes. Good evening, Dr. Battle, board chair, board members, and guests. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about the launch of our new signature initiative designed to re envision the central office as a support hub for schools and stakeholders. In all my work in education, I've often seen people talk about the importance of the central office serving the schools, but this is a whole new level of commitment and ded dedication to the reality of the work that's done here in this office. Next slide, please. To highlight the importance of this event, or this initiative, it's also become one of our core tenets as well, because it speaks clearly to who we are and what we want. Next slide, please. There you go, one more. Oh, I can do this myself, can I? Excuse me. <laughs> In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus detailed his theory that the Earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around. In the same fashion, changing the name of our central office to a support hub changes our focus because the center of our world and our attention should be students and schools. This change comes in several ways. There are physical changes that you may have already seen today, and there are also changes in our perception and our conception of what our purpose and our job is. And this will help lead us to practical and procedural changes that will accelerate our work in schools. You can see some of the rebranding that's been done in a physical sense outdoors in front of our building, as well as some of the wayfinding signage that you'll see down by the road and other places to help direct people to the right place here in our support hub. We have other rebranding inside our uh, Family Information Center as well. And Dr. Battle has shared our mission to ensure that every student is known. To help us in that effort, we're unveiling an exciting new initiative to display student artwork on a rotating basis in our support hub. If you have not had the chance to do a gallery walk, we encourage you to spend some time, like I have, marveling at the amazing paintings, drawings, and artistry that our students have produced far in excess of what I am able to produce myself. 
Dr. Battle has also instituted several director cabinets, and the core of this transformation is to make sure we're listening to all of our stakeholders so we can change our practices and modify procedures. Our director cabinets are comprised of representatives from several different areas, students, teachers, the support hub here, school staff, and principals. And we meet regularly to make sure that we can better realize our North Star. We have several representatives here tonight who would like to speak to you as well, and I'm gonna first introduce DK Hayes, who is a Stratford High School student. Good evening. Since middle school, I've been given a chance to show my leadership abilities, and for the last couple of years, I have had the opportunity to be a student voice for all across MNPS even during the early stages of COVID-19. With this opportunity, I have attended a great number of virtual meetings with my peers, MNPS leaders, and partners. During those meetings, MNPS wanted to hear from students and know how they can better support students and their families. Also during this time of COVID, I've asked about my senior year. My big question was, what will graduation and prom look like? Within those discussions and emails, they said due to COVID-19, prom would be social distance and there would be no food or dancing, and graduation was still a question. Here's an example of how my voice has been heard. Since then, Dr. Springer and her team and MNPS partners have worked hard to answer my questions and many more. And I am thankful to say that even though we still have to follow safety guidelines due to COVID-19, prom will be May 1st hosted on our school's football field and pictured to be a night under the stars. Um, and graduation will be May 21st held in person downtown. This has showed me that MNPS has taken a new turn on making decisions and gaining insight with a, certain, with a certainty that they care. At the end of almost every meeting that I have had the pleasure of being in, Dr. Springer has said one thing that made myself feel important and assured me that students will always be in the picture. She said somewhere along the words, we don't do this to you, but with you and for you, and we definitely cannot do it without you. And so I would like to leave you with this. Please continue to have students weighing in on board level decisions and discussions. Never stop giving them the opportunity to step up and lead and continue to hear the student voices. Thank you. We would next like to introduce Natalie Boyd, a math teacher at Hume Fogg High School. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Natalie Boyd, and I am a math teacher at Hume Fogg. I've been teaching in MMPS for 12 years, and this past year I had the opportunity to be a part of the director's teacher cabinet, which was a fantastic experience. Um, if I had to summarize it briefly, I would say that the director's teacher cabinet gave teachers an opportunity to be informed and also heard. And so those two things together, if you know teachers, that's, that's all we want. <laughs> um, we want to know what's going on so that we can make decisions that are best for our students. We also want to be heard and know that people at the district level understand what we're going through. And it was such a wonderful experience to get to sit down with teachers across the district on Zoom and, um, and meet. So. The district leaders and Dr. Battle were there, which number one was just like, you know, we're here getting to sit with district leaders. And then also um, they asked us questions. What's working well? What's not working well? Uh, what do you need for support? What do you need? What ideas do you have? And all of those kind of came together. We could see that they were actually being addressed because in future meetings, we would actually talk about what had we had already talked about. Um, and we could see things in district emails and know that we were making a difference, that people were listening to us. And it was just, just such a massive relief, especially in a hard year, to know that we were being heard. So I think um, the director's teacher cabinet really was important for engaging with teachers for morale, but also when we get to be informed and heard, we feel respected and valued. And that ultimately was, um, was just an incredible experience. So I'm glad that I got to be a part of it this year. Thank you. Next, we'd like to invite Takato Jackson Price. Uh 
Good evening. My name is Takaka Price, and I'm a member of the Director Support Hub Cabinet. This is my 24th year in Metro Nashville Public Schools. I don't look like it, I know, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and I currently serve as the Classroom Management Specialist, or what some of you all may call COMP, Classroom Organization um, and Management Program Specialist, as well as an SEL Specialist. My experience on the cabinet has been one that I felt like my voice was actually heard. As a classroom teacher and former Encore teacher, I often felt the central office was a separate entity. And when they came into the building, oh, you knew something was going on, okay? <laughs> but being a part of this cabinet and the, and the works of the re-envisioning of central office as a support hub, it's the beginning of changing that narrative or that imaginative thought that I had as a teacher. See, it begins the thought that it's not the us versus them, but that we are one unit and are here to help support all the stakeholders, that being our students, our families, our teachers, and our community. Thank you so much for the opportunity for me to be a part of the cabinet. Thank you. I'd like to invite Nina Stroud, an exceptional ed paraprofessional from Harris Hillman. Good evening, Metro Board members and Dr. Battle. My name is Nina Stroud, and I am a paraprofessional at Harris Hillman Special Day School. In my 11 years of working with Metro, have I never felt like my opinion mattered? Not until I was asked to be a part of the director staff cabinet. It has been such an honor and a privilege to work alongside with Dr. Battle. She communicated with us um, her plans for a central office and the new support hub. Dr. Battle even asked us, support staff, what we needed to assist her in reaching the North Star. When we expressed our needs, such as having laptops for paraprofessionals, um, Dr. Battle, she, um, she listened and she delivered. Our input was appreciated and validated. Because of her willingness to listen to all within MMPS from admin to the students, this year for me has been a success. I hope Dr. Battle will continue the cabinet in the future and that I too can assist her in making our district the best in Tennessee. Thank you. We'd like to invite Shavon Davis Lewis, principal of JFK Middle School. Greetings to the board and to Dr. Battle. I'm Siobhan Davis-Lewis, Executive Principal at John F. Kennedy Middle School. And first, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to share my experience, um, not only with the PAG, but as you've heard all of the previous people talk about, they've been a part of Metro for a decade or more. Well, I'm the newbie. I've only been here a couple of years, and the supporting and warm feeling that I immediately got as the newbie on the block has just been outstanding. But today, I'm here specifically to talk to you about my experience um, with the Principal's Advisory Group. Dr. Battle uses the Principal Advisory Group for the purpose of obtaining advice and counsel from principals all across the district. She also has um, other supervisory personnel, and we're all there in a collaborative matter um, to use all of our talents, our strengths, and our intellect to help Dr. Battle and the rest of the support hub govern and make best decisions for students, teachers, principals, all the way to the top. Um, we are truly a link between the support hub in each and every school. While not every school is represented, there is a representative for every school. And we are reaching out. There's this two-way th two way street that's a through line from, from Dr. Battle to the schools and back again. Um, one specific example of this is the critical issues update. It's one of my favorite parts of each of our PAC meetings because not only does the support hub share their concerns and the critical 
issues and seek our feedback and our input and our knowledge, but we also have the opportunity to do the same thing, to share our critical issues at the ground level. Um, and what's refreshing, I've been, while I've only been with Metro for two years, I've been an educator for 22 years, and um, it's nice and refreshing to not be afraid to share what your critical concerns are and to know that your voice is going to be heard. And just as, as many of the previous speakers have said, um, we get a response, we get feedback, we get updates on those critical issues, and we are invited to the table to be a part of the solution and to be a part of the decision making. I could stand here for hours and talk about the amazing support I've received as a new principal um, in Metro. I've been successful here so quickly because of all of the warmth and support from the support hub, um, but I'll end by just saying um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful for a leader who understands the importance of making everyone feel respected and valued. And rounding us out, Jennifer Reinecker, principal at Donaldson Middle School. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Walker. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Jennifer Reinecker. That's one of my fantastic parents in the back there. Um, I am the executive principal at Donaldson Middle School, and I've been at Donaldson Middle School for nine years now. And this year, I've also gotten the privilege of representing our middle school colleagues at the principal advisory group. And Dr. Davis Lewis already talked about some of the things I was gonna talk about tonight, so I'm gonna adjust my direction a little bit and talk about the fact that at the Support Hub, we have a great group of departments this year that have worked really hard to develop plans to help us in this year that we've had to take apart and reinvent every little piece of how school works and then put it back together. Mm -hmm. And when you do that for 150 something schools, there is no possible way to remember every little piece of every little lens for the needs of every single type of school. The principal advisory group has given us an opportunity to preview a lot of those plans, to ask our critical questions, to give feedback, to bring up issues, to let some of those concerns come to the forefront so that we are ready to address them as a district, so that we are ready to address them as a school. It's helped us streamline some things so we aren't having to build every piece of every plan individually at our school level. We have frameworks to work around with a lot of things, a lot more things than we have ever had before. Now, none of us want another school year where we have to take every single piece of every part of our school day apart and put it back together. You know, there are certain aspects of school like going through a lunch line that we have never had to put a whole lot of hours of planning into how is the lunch line gonna work. But this year we've had to do that for every piece of our day for both in-person and for virtual students. We don't wanna do that again, but what this has done is created a structure and a format that allows us to look at our district policies and practices moving forward identify those things that do need to be evaluated and adjusted and changed, provide feedback and may make those adjustments moving forward because continuing to do things just because that's the way it's always been done is also not gonna move us as a district. So I appreciate the opportunity to ask all of my questions and Dr. Battle will tell you I ask lots of them. <laughs> So that we can make a better product for our students, for our families, for our staff, and for our schools to run better. And that's really the goal. So thank you. To close this out, uh, William Glasser uh, created something called reality therapy. It's now called choice theory. And what he said was, if you want to change how you feel, you change what you think and you change what you do. And so that was our mission behind the support hub is obviously, as Dr. Ronecker said, this is a year like any other. And we realized to come back to school in person would take a significant lift from the central office as well. And as you remember, in January, we began sending out central off, uh, support hub members to schools one day a week. And that's been happening since uh, January till now. And employees have done a great job supporting schools and building relationships. 
I'll just breeze through these. These are several different comments and emails that we got from principals talking about the impact that the, the support hub and, and the school support initiative has done for them. We also want to highlight <coughs> the Human Resources Department is highlighting a customer service training um, to help accelerate how we work with schools and how we can provide the school's exemplary customer service, as well as including things like our tech centers and the work that's been done there and certain uh, office hours that we've created to help teachers. Uh, every week we have a licensure office hours. We've had office hours for employment and things of that nature just to help teachers stay connected to us and support members find the support that they need. Want to just briefly close with this being one of our signature initiatives and our core tenants. And before I kick it over to Dr. Battle, I want to say to everyone, welcome to the support hub. Dr. Battle, over to you. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Barnes, and to all of um, our speakers this um, evening. Um, um, Y'all kind of caught me off guard a little bit, not knowing what everyone was going to share, but the intent here um, was to exemplify not only in name, not only in cosmetic changes, um, but in behaviors and actions. Um, we are transforming ourselves into the support hub that we want to be and that we need to be to ensure every MMPS student is known. So thank you all for your great work, um, for your partnership, and for your collaboration as we um, move MMPS forward towards our North Star of becoming the premier large school district in Tennessee and beyond. So thank you all um, for that. Also tonight, um, in the spirit of celebrations and working um, well together and in a collaborative manner, I'd like to honor a group of people who truly saved the day and saved a student's life last week. Last Thursday, we had an emergency um, at John Overton High School, which is my alma mater. It was a difficult situation for everyone. But the team at Overton reacted quickly, calmly, decisively, and effectively. Physical education teacher Christina Carlson saw the young man needing help. <laughs> History teacher and track coach Deshaun Buchanan and PE teacher and basketball coach John Hobson isolated the situation. Meanwhile, health science teacher Beth Wilson, who is a nurse, rendered first aid to the student and directed her coworkers in caring for him. Now, as Ms. Carlson, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Buchanan, and Mr. Hobson were working with the student, school resource officer Steve Snitzer was methodically coordinating the medical response, and he is unable to be here tonight, but today is his birthday. So happy birthday to you. Um, and behind the scenes, executive principal Jill Pittman and her administrative team were coordinating outreach to the students, parents, and staff and managing the daily operations of the school. Now, as a previous teacher and principal, I will tell you that this is the kind of situation schools never want, schools never want to face. We go into this line of work to teach, to educate, to help young people grow into adults and, le and the leaders we know that they deserve to be and that they will be and can be. But sometimes we have to step up to deal with the emergencies and these teachers and this officer and this principal stepped up with poise and purpose. As Officer Snyder wrote in an email he sent to me, he stated, I want you to know from my heart, that Dr. Pittman and the staff here at Overton High School did an amazing job in helping during this time of need. The swift support and fast thinking was key in this positive outcome. Officer Snyder couldn't be with us tonight, as I mentioned, because today is his um, birthday, but the rest of these quick thinking Overton staff members are here for us to recognize them. Mr. Buchanan, Ms. Carlson, Mr. Hobson, Dr. Pittman, and Ms. Wilson, we cannot thank you enough for your heroic actions on Thursday, April 22nd, 2001. You represent the very best of Metro Nashville Public Schools, and we thank you. We would like to present certificates to each of you in recognition of your exemplary service to our schools. And if everybody would stand with me and thank them for their heroic
And Dr. Pittman and team, if anybody would like to share any words, please are free to do so. I just want to say that while we're shining a spotlight on truly extraordinary efforts by teachers to keep a single student from going under, which meant everything to his family and to our school family. It also gives us an opportunity to think about the many ordinary things that teachers and schools and their staff members do to keep families and students from going under in ways that are not always as dramatic as this, but nonetheless, the work that we all love. So thank you. Thank you all. I'm sorry, before you all go, I, this has been a horrific month. I mean, I, I, you all know I'm a crier, but I, that was a rough day. And I mean, as soon as we started getting the calls and the emails and the text messages, if you have a child, that is your worst fear. But to know that we have educators that, frankly, you were probably in danger yourselves mm -hmm. and you saved a baby. I just, I, that's not lost on me. It's not lost on us. I, you all don't get the things that you need as regularly as you deserve it, but just thank you. And to all of those teachers that weren't in this situation that could have been as well, just know that you are supported, you are loved. Our, our national community has not been as thoughtful around our educators as, as we should be, but thank you. I'm just thank you. I, I cannot say that enough, and I would I would be remiss if I missed this opportunity because it is it just it was it is a rough month. So many children have passed. So many children have been murdered, and and you allowed Nashville to save one. So, just oh, do what you do. I appreciate you. I'm sorry to have gotten so emotional, but I, I, I enrolled my son in pre-K this week. This week, I, I, I went on the MNPS website, I went through all the tedious but necessary steps, and it became very real for me as a parent that literally anything can happen to your child when they leave your, your, your home, when they leave your womb, you know? And so to know that we had educators that stepped in for a child is just, that is gonna be a highlight that I'll hold on to for a while. Um, but with that, we do have other business, other um, uh, MNPS decisions to make, so we will move on to our consent agenda. Are there any requests to amend the, agen the uh, consent agenda as listed? Yes, I would like to pull um, B8, please. Orion Building Corporation. All right, so that's B8. Any other amendments? All right, is there a motion on the floor to accept the consent agenda as amended? I move approval. Second? Second. All right, uh, we have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Unanimous. All right, we will move on to B8, Ms. Bush. Yes, <clears throat> I wanted to um, make a motion to vote on this line item as a separate vote. And I guess I'll start. Um, I'm going to be abstaining from this particular line item. Um, I have made all of my concerns necessary before um, re regarding Orion Building, Building Corporation, so I won't get, I won't go back into it. So I just basically want to make this uh, a separate um, line item as a vote. Okay, so there's no motion. Is there a motion on the floor? Move approval of the item B8 Orion Building Corporation contract. All right, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right, all opposed and three abstaining. All right, we'll now move on to... Uh, the motion passed. Uh, yes, the motion passes, I'm sorry. All right, a resolution regarding the addition of fifth grade to Purpose Preparatory Academy, Mr. Little. Huh? This was just a, okay, great. This was a resolution that was um, 
tons of parents reached out, um, had an opportunity to talk to the school principal. I've worked in the Pearl Cone cluster, and as we're doing fifth grade realignment, um, that cluster is changing. And so the addition for Purpose Prep is just to have their fifth grade realigned with the fifth grade um, in the Pearl Cone cluster. So I'm moving for approval for that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you gotta read the resolution. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Did, do we have to move in? Do we have to read the whole thing? <laughs> yeah, we're asking you. Uh, just for process sake. For uh, process sake, it would steps. be best if, if nothing else, if he at least read the resolving clause. Okay. Okay, uh, could you, if you don't mind, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Dr. Severe. We'll, we'll let him, no, never mind, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Little. Do we, do we have another copy? Because I'm, is it in the board packet? It is in the board packet, but I have one here. Would you mind passing it? Thank you. <clears throat> All righty. So it says, whereas beginning in 2020, the director of schools presented the MMPS Reimagine Ed framework to the Board of Education for consideration. And whereas the Board of Education has endorsed the MMPS Reimagine Ed initiative, whereas that framework included the realignment of grade level in particular school clusters to K to five for elementary schools and six to eight for middle schools. Whereas the Board of Education approved the grade realignment in Pearl Cone, which is at Cluster, Maplewood, and White's Creek clusters, beginning with the upcoming 2021-2022 school year. And whereas Purpose Prep Academy is a charter school approved by the MMPS Board of Education, and whereas Purpose Prep Academy primarily draws their enrollment from students in the Maplewood and Pearl Cone clusters. Whereas Purpose Prep Academy currently enrolls students in grades K through four, whereas Purpose Prep Preparatory Academy leadership and families have appeared before the Board of Education to request that Purpose Prep Preparatory Academy en enrollment be expanded for the 2021-2022 school year to include fifth grade so that it aligns with the neighboring district-run schools. And whereas there is no prohibition on a public charter school authorizer entering into a voluntary amendment of the chartering agreement, and whereas MMPS resolves to enter into chartering agreement negotiations for the sole purpose of adding fifth grade to Purpose Preparatory Academy, and whereas both MMPS and Purpose Preparatory Academy will look favorably upon an agreement that included an addition of fifth grade, but did not raise the total enrollment capacity of 380 students. Whereas Purpose Prep Preparatory Academy would consistent with their current chartering agreement be required to offer its newly included fifth grade to all currently enrolled Purpose Preparatory Academy fourth grade students and could not counsel students away from this option. And whereas both MMPS and Purpose Preparatory Academy agree that this amendment does not extend the duration of the current agreement in any way, therefore, be it resolved that the MMPS administration is directed to begin contract negotiations with Purpose Preparatory Academy consistent with the language herein. Man, thank you. Can I get that back though? Okay, you want it back. All right, uh, we have a motion. Is there a second? Okay, for the purpose of discussion, I will second this. Yep. All right, um, go ahead, Mr. Little. Yeah, and, and I would um, ask that the board support this amendment. One, just knowing anything about Purpose Prep and where they're located in the city. Um, they're connected to Pearl Cone, which has been a, um, that has a, a number of priority schools in the district. And if you've ever visited that school, if you ever talked to parents, if you ever seen um, their school leader, Lagra Newman, you know she goes all out for her kids, not just academically, but culturally. And I think morally, as we hear from parents who have not chosen to send their kids to school in that, in that cluster, shouldn't have shouldn't have to send their kids back to the same schools that they chose to um, not send their kids to where they were zoned. And so I would ask that you guys give this a chance so we can come for a vote because at the end of the day, it is about the kids and the school has been a reward school um, two or three times. And, and it's been regarded across the, the state, if not the country, as some of the things that they're doing inside and outside the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, uh, Dr. Gentry? Yeah, 
<clears throat> so um, I was uh, kind of surprised by this um, to see that it was on behalf of Purpose Prep. I thought it was going to be one of our district schools. I think there's a Stanford Montessori in District 4 um, that's been asking for the same um, consideration for to be included in this wave of realignment of fifth grade back to the elementary tier. So I also had a chance to speak with Ms. Lever. She did call. I think she called several board members. I also spoke with Mr. Little and shared that conversation with him. So I will go through some of the points uh, from that conversation here on the board floor. So one of the comments that was made in both conversations was the concern that Purpose Prep was unaware that we were realigning uh, fifth grade back to the elementary tier. And it has been associated with MNPS Reimagine Ed, um, but it was a topic under MNPS Next, if I'm not mistaken, which was several years ago. Would you mind bringing your mic? I'm sorry. sorry. That we have always had the intention um, to realign fifth grade to the elementary tier. So this isn't news. It didn't just come up as a part of Reimagine <coughs> Ed. Um, the other thing here that it says is that the grade, so it aligns with neighboring district-run schools. So another comment that I made, and this is Sharon speaking, um, was that you know we have not had the opportunity to really have alignment with our charter schools. Even though that was the original intent for charters to come into the district, to be creative and imaginative and innovative, um, come up with strategy that we can then uh, deploy uh, throughout our district-run schools. That has not been a consistent practice. We've not been able to have the conversations to talk about where we needed charter support, to talk about the extent to which we needed charter support, for how long we needed charter support to make adjustments and then be able to improve the offerings that we make for our students. Our priority schools are our priority schools and they are our priority. Um, they are not uh, something for us to shun parents away from. Uh, I am almost offended that we would actually say that, um, that we would uh, not force a parent to, um, to put their child in a school. I have always been an advocate for providing those options, and I've said that as a candidate, I've said that as a board member, but we have made adjustments. We are actually focused, and the reason we are realigning fifth grade back to the elementary tier is to bring our parents back to our district-run schools, that we are putting the resources. We recognize that parents are leaving MNPS after fourth grade because of the challenges of having a fifth grade student in a middle school environment. We know, and I have said this repeatedly, that having had a child go from fifth grade to sixth grade, the gap, from fourth to fifth, the gap, especially in math, is amazing to me. I, I don't even know how they pick up from where they pick up in, this, in middle school because there's nowhere near where they ended in fourth grade. And so we're addressing that with our numeracy um, initiatives as well. So we are doing the work to improve the outcomes in our currently labeled priority schools. We are doing the work to close that gap in this child's experience from fourth grade to fifth grade. We are doing the work and we're putting in the resources to improve the outcomes for all of our fifth grade students. We are starting where we're starting. So those students who should have by now already made a choice about where they're gonna be in fifth grade, I should point that out, but they are now will have better options in the clusters of Whites Creek and Pearl Cone to have a different experience than the one they would have had a couple of years ago. So that, uh, that alignment with neighboring district-run schools, again, is almost offensive because we don't get the chance to align on initiatives. We don't get a chance to align on outcomes. We don't get a chance to align on goals when a charter school decides it wants to exist within MNPS. They present to us, we approve or we deny, we deny, they go to the state, they get approved, and they're here and they're here. So there is, it is not uh, a good feeling that we seem to be in an adversarial type competitive relationship with charters. It was never our goal, but it is what has happened. It is what we have evolved to. And so I ran to be a board member of this board. And so my goal and my job and my responsibility is to protect the resources, protect the outcomes, and protect the goals I've set forth for my director. So I continue through this um, to say that uh, this be it resolved that I would direct my one employee to make a decision that is totally uh, contradicts what I've asked her to do. I have charged her, we have charged her, with making fifth grade experience better for all students across MNPS. And it's not to bail on her now 
when I've asked her to do it, when I've approved a plan that she has put forth for doing that, I'm not going to bail on her now. So my vote is against this resolution for the reasons I've stated. Thank you, Dr. Gentry. Any other thoughts? And, and I'll make one more comment, then I'll, I'll let it go. I, I also, and, and thank you, Dr. Gentry, like I wrote it, like unaware of realignment, um, didn't have the time, is not forcing a parent um, to go back to their school. But one thing I think that we missed out on is when we think about the parental, because my phone drops, as we think about the parental support, as a parent on this board, I've exercised choice. As most parents on this board, we have all exercised choice. And when I think about giving parents another option and not forcing them, really giving them an option to choose a school that they best see fit for their kid. And I, I want to take all of the, I, I guess, for my rhetoric, it's just, do I give parents the opportunity to make the best decision for their kid when they have already shown they have made choices um, outside of their zone school? And that's why I wanted to bring this before, not because it's charter or traditional, only because it's, it's about a parent's choice um, and they have kids in the district because as we, as a board, those charter schools, although they're agreements, they're part of MNPS, we authorize them, we hold them accountable, and we make sure they fulfill that capacity. And, that, and as I look at that school particularly, and I look at reward school, reward school is mostly um, around academic achievement, and that school has been a reward school at least two or three times. And so that, that'll be my, my closing statement, but I really hope I can get some support, not for the type of school, but for the parents who choose to send their kids to that school, who have graduated from MMPS, who still have other kids in MMPS schools, but just choose different on this one. All right, Mrs. Pupa Walker. So I, um, I have tremendous respect for Allegra Newman and for the work at Purpose Prep. I've been to fundraising breakfasts for uh, Purpose Prep. I. I, I just know that they are doing remarkable work there. My concern with this is twofold. One is I believe they're over-enrolled currently. Is that correct, Mr. Little? Um, based on Ms. Newman, they are, they are still within their grace. They're in their grace. Right. And so what happens Would you mind explaining by being in their charter grace? Charter is for 380 students. The grace enrollment is for 25. They are actually at capacity. They're at 405 today. Okay. So in order to add a new grade, they would have to accept less students in lower grades? Is that what would hap to happen here? Or it could be a, for a small number of kids who didn't have options um, to get into the, the zone schools they apply for through the lottery. So I, I, again, I have respect for the founder director of this school, but I cannot imagine having to hire math, science, language arts, I don't know who else, for a new grade for a handful of children. Again, that's a choice. If, that, if so be it, if that's what we choose, that's their charge to create a new grade for four kids, five kids, and hire a bunch of staff. It's a losing proposition financially. Last year it would have been three kids that went so, to the school. So my, my thing is, is is this actually what the purpose prep community wants to do next year? And so that's, I'm just, it's a rhetorical question. And then my second thing is, we can just start bringing a resolution every time we want to change a charter any old time. If this is the, if this is the sort of the process. process that we're going to undertake here, that we're going to say, well, you know what, I, I kind of want my, this particular charter school to have more kids or more grades or more this or more that instead of following the process. And so I am a believer that we have one of the best charter authorizer processes in the country, and we need to stick to that. And um, this is not a slight on purpose prep. This is simply a matter of due diligence and good governance that we remain sort of in um, <coughs> compliance with a process that is transparent, that everyone else is expected to follow, and um, truly hope that they will submit a, a you know, a, a proposal for an, an amendment to add fifth grade in the future. So that, that's mine, my thoughts. Oh, Dr. Ginger, I'm sorry. Did anyone? Dr. Ginger? Sorry, go ahead. Um, 
I so I have a question for Dr. Battle or the staff. So oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't. I don't think that our staff was involved in this. I think this was just a Dr. Uh, I mean, a Mr. Little. I have, a clear, well, Mr. Little, I have a clarifying question. Yes. So you have to be in a lottery to go to your zone school. So if someone moves in, you, you said that they weren't lottery into their zone school, so they can't go to the school. So the question is, there's no fifth grade. If whether we pass or fail this, what would be the next step? Because I didn't think you need a lottery to get into your zone school. So I but, want a clarification yeah, of that. So. Yeah. So let me clarify. You don't need a lottery to get into your zone school. You need to access the lottery if you want to do school choice. And so most of those families that were at Purpose Prep who are transitioning out of the fourth grade have exercised choice. And it's a few students who had other choices but did not get it. And, and, and I'll go into it, it's one thing to want to do right by all kids, but it's also another thing that I hear from parents a lot where you don't want to play with your child's education. And we have a, we have a rating system. And in the Pearl Cone Cluster, some of the schools are doing really well and some of the schools academically are not. And I think those parents have just made a choice not to send their kids back to the zone school because of that, because of those academic um, choices and successes. So priority school, reward school, and yeah. So the, so the kids that, so the kids do have a place to go, but the parents are choosing not to put them into the zone school. Is that correct? Yes, for okay. clarification, they have, a, they have a place to go if it's the zone school, I think, in that cluster, the Pearl Cone cluster, I think the feeder middle schools are John Early, McKissick, and maybe, maybe those are the only two. Um, maybe Haynes, I don't know. Um, McKissick and Ed. But a lot of those parents don't want to send their kids to the school. Okay, I want to clarify yeah. that because I was going to be okay. concerned if, they could, if there was a lottery to get into your zone schools because that's part of there's a place for every child who's a resident of Davidson County to go yeah. a, a, I, to a zone school. And, and I think for John a Early, zone school. I just want to clarify that that part yeah, of John Early, there's a lottery to go into a zone school when a lottery exists for choice options, and that there's a place for a child to go, just from a technical um, educational perspective. So that's all I just want to clarify because you okay. said zone school, they weren't lottery. They didn't get the lottery going to their zone school. Right. Okay. So for me, it's and to echo what uh, Ms. Walker said, it's not about the quality of purpose prep. For me, this is a governance issue. When a charter operator decides to, to, ish, to apply for a charter, for some reason, whether it's philosophical, whether it's educational philosophy, whether you do not agree of how we, the district is running school, you choose to, to apply for a charter because you want to educate the children to a certain extent because you believe the district is not doing a job that you feel is right you disagree with the educational philosophy of the district, or you feel you want to try a new academic method um, to educate children. And once, you, once a charter operator um, applies for the charter, part of that is a sense of independence. You take on the responsibility of independence. Part of the independence is governorship. That the Purpose Press Board, their job is to govern the school. Their responsibilities for fiduciary about when they apply for the school, they are responsibility for the strategic plan of that school, where that school wants to go, how that school is operated, the philosophy that school works in, and how they choose to operate the school. This is a discussion that's been going on for several years that the district was going to move fifth graders back into elementary. That was not done in secret. It is job of purpose prep to, to monitor what we do as a district and to do strategic planning accordingly, just like we do with the state and just like we do with the federal government. When that decision made is the purview of our governing system. Purpose prep just renewed their charter several months ago. My job is that it was part of the board's duty that when they renewed their charter to think strategically about where they want their school to go for the next 10 years and how that looks. We have a very specific, very rigid defined process. We spent at least an hour at our board retreat led by Dr. Griffin explaining what state laws and regulations that we have to provide and that we would have to bind with fidelity of how we approve charters, how we amend charters and how that operates that show that we are not really liable 
for those decisions. And for me, it's an issue of when it comes to governance, it's the responsibility of the purpose prep board to strategically think how they want to expand, when they want to expand, and how they apply for that expansion. The fact that we move independently is that we govern independently. When you go to about alignment with metro schools, that alignment did not occur when we had to consolidate four schools. There was not a partnership reached out as we are part of this cluster. How do we work in alignment to the neighboring schools next to us? And that wasn't part of that. We as a board do not have the luxury of governing just one school. We have to govern 162 schools. And that's the advantage of being a part of a charter. You have the luxury of governing one school. And in governing at one school, you're taking advantage of bringing forth this resolution to do it. But as we talked about earlier with the book thing, when it comes to governing, my concern is now we're setting a precedent. This precedent has economic repercussions to this. First, we have the economic governing precedents. I was just at an Overton PAC meeting last night. There is pressure, advocacy for Rachel Ann and I, sorry, Ms. Elrod, <laughs> and myself for Croft, for bringing the fifth grader, not, not because Croft is not a bad school, we love Dr. Lewis, that's not an issue. The issue is the parents do not want to wait, just like Purpose Pratt wants to wait, but I, this board, have fiduciary responsibility to do it in a thing that's fair, that way that aligns with our economic resources, but also what's strategic. When Dr. Battle and her staff came with the plan of how we're going to roll out, it was strategic. Part of it was facility usage. What is capacity? What is resources that we have to expend to do it? It wasn't all about academics. It was about do we have the financial resources to physically put fifth graders back into a middle school? How do we change the flow of enrollment? Because you're affecting several schools. There are ripple effects. And if we do this, what is accepting another Croft parent advocating Ms. Elrod or myself saying, I want you to put a resolution forward? We don't even know the budget number yet. We haven't got our budget allocation yet. So if we do this between now and June 30th, how many board meetings can we come, another charter school comes, and then we have to totally reconcile our budget because the money follows the child. If it follows the child, we have a zero-sum budget. The budget resources have to come from something, and we cannot plan for that because at any given time we start this precedent, we cannot budget when a transfer of dollars is going to happen, and as we plan and allocate for the entire district, then one by one by one, then that's going to change what we do, and that affects cuts for other areas. We have to make the tough decisions. We had to make a very tough decision of consolidating four schools. We took the political repercussions of that. We took the accountability of that. That's our job. But the luxury of one school to say changing because they did not do the strategic planning to do so, in several months, they can apply for an amendment. I encourage them to do so. It's not about the quality of performance. It's not a quality of school. It's a quality of setting a precedent of what about our fellow district schools, whether you're Julia Green, whether you're um, Glencliff Elementary, Lachlan. whether you're Lachlan, whether you're whatever district, you know, Gower Elementary. We have schools in this district that parents want this to happen tomorrow. We understand the urgency, but we do not have the financial resources to do it. But we also don't want to set a precedent of because you because you miss something to fix, to turn around and fix it, not realizing you just have a luxury of governing one school. And so I know that parents want this. I feel for those parents. But there's a governing process. We are governing a system. And with that system comes precedence and becomes responsibility. That this, this is not a ripple effect where it's just an isolated incident. This is an incident, and this is a part of a charter. If you choose to act and operate independently, you have to govern accordingly and take the responsibility of that governance. And that's the responsibility of their board to strategically plan when to ask, whether it was to ask several months ago when they changed the, when they asked for renewal for the next 10 years, or to do it. Because my next question was, if we did choose not to expand or not to do the alteration of fifth grade to elementary, then when would Purpose Prep ask for this asked to be expanded. Would you have waited until we'd done it, or would you have the foresight to do it because you feel that's the best thing for your students? And that's the responsibility of them and their board. I'm not criticizing what their board's done. 
that's the choice that they made. But as a board member here, there's a governing precedence that given that we have what, at least, I'm assuming 80 elementary schools, that we cannot do this. But it also sets a precedent for other entities that's saying, we don't like the decision that's made, so I'm going to demand you to go in, into negotiations with your administration for something that you don't like. Because I can tell you, there's other government groups, entities, employee groups that would do the exact same thing. And I think that sets a very bad precedent that we're making this decision for that. So I think there's a very clear process. The charter amendment process, the charter application process is a very rigid process. It's a very um, prescribed process that we have to follow. And to go to that also sets us up for liability because then we're going outside that process that's set by a state that we cannot change. And I think that's a critical part of it. It's about governance. It's not about the quality of schools. It's not about parents advocating, because parents advocate for a lot of different things. And we have to unfortunately say no when we don't want to because of limitations of governance, legal limitation, and financial limitations. So I wish very much that we can do this. But there is a presence that I am very, very hesitant to set to do, to do this, that then we're asking any other charter school to come and subvert the process that we prescribed and that we worked on. Dr. Gentry? So I don't know if uh, Ms. Robert is aware. How many students are we talking about? And is this resolution, because it's open-ended on the number, there is no, so is there even, to Ms. Player Peter's point, there's even, not even a way as it's written to even project what the fiscal impact would be. So it's open-ended. So how many students are we talking? Are we talking about trying to accommodate every student who didn't get the school of their choice? Mr. Little? Yeah, I think in that question, I, would it make a difference in the decision of this board if you knew the number? No, but I'm, I have a bigger point, so you don't even have to answer it. My point is, if we're not trying to accommodate every student, then you're trying to create a lottery system that we've been criticized for that kind of helps to justify the creation of the charters in the first place. So I don't know what, I, I mean, it's almost hypocritical um, to even take that approach if we're gonna actually lottery off a handful of seats to those four rising fifth graders who didn't get the school of their choice. So I, I, I am struggling with many aspects of this resolution as written. And, and the way the lottery system works, as, as we all know, if you have more applications and seats, whether it's Purpose Prep, MLK, Glendale, it goes into a blind lottery. I think that's the route they were looking, if they had more applications and seats available based on their charter and agreement. Could you say that last part one more time? I'm sorry. Say that again. Which part, which, which part did you hear? Just repeat the whole thing. I said it, the way it, it works, it's, it's a blind lottery. If, if Purpose Prep had more applications, then they had seats. So let's say it was, it was 20 students, but they only had 19 seats. Mm -hmm. And so they would have to do a blind lottery as is. MLK, Glendale, Lachlan, East, any, any metro school that has more applications and seats that we prescribe goes into a lottery. And so in my opinion, that's, that was their intention if they had more applications. Okay. And Seats. Okay, so the answer is yes. Okay. Yes to what? That there would be a lottery. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll say as the lone pearl cone cluster <laughs> parent, like I said earlier, I was so excited to sign my son up for pre-K, and I know that Purpose Prep is an option. I'm not sure if they had a pre-K, but I know it's an option for elementary school for sure, right? But to a larger point, and this isn't as much ideology, but advocacy, something to keep, keep in mind. I appreciate that we want to keep parents supported, that we want to make sure that those parents that are choosing with their feet, that we support them and their children wherever they go. Then I think about, I always go back to Lachlan and Warner. That's always my good comparison because so many parents choose with their feet from a school that is great. I mean, Warner is a blue ribbon school, right? But as uh, but people are choosing with their feet for many different reasons that I will come back to that at a different time, but they choose with their feet. That doesn't mean that I don't still advocate for Warner. Mm -hmm. I hear exponentially more from Lachlan parents than I do from Warner parents. That's just a disenfranchisement issue. That's just a the nature of being in America where you are disenfranchised, maybe you are even poverty stricken based on your socioeconomic status or your family makeup, whatever the reason, you may not know who to come to 
to, who to advocate to, or what to ask for. So I, I always pause when I, when I think about, well, parents are asking for it. Well, how many parents don't even know that they can ask for something? How many parents just aren't even engaged or you know, just haven't, been, haven't felt empowered? And I'm hoping, and this is, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to bully you, Dr. Battle, but I'm hoping that my son gets into Jones for the three-year-old pre-K. It's okay if he doesn't. We'll just reapply next year. But I, I make to, to make a larger point, really, <laughs> I think about that all the time. If I'm going to choose Jones and choose McKissick and choose Pearl Cone because they're my school system, or they're my, they're my my district, they're my schools, then I've got to be mindful of the historic disenfranchisement of my neighbors that never will come to a school board meeting. Not because they, not because they shouldn't, because I would love for them to, but they just don't even, you know what I'm saying? They don't know that they can. And so I don't want to continue to ignore the students who don't have knowledgeable, savvy advocates for, to make way for, for parents and families who are the loudest in the room. It's great that we have parents speak up. I want you to speak up. But there are so many who don't that I've got to keep them in mind also. But we always go through that circle. We always talk about the schools that are doing well, the parents that are asking for something, and we completely ignore the babies who are just left out of that conversation. There's also the idea that even though I'm in the Pearl Cone cluster, that means that I have our two academic magnet high schools. That means that I consistently have parents asking for a third or even a fourth academic magnet high school. And I have to consistently tell them no, that that's philosophically I don't support that. And strategically, we are trying to make sure that every school is c competitive with our magnets, that every school has the AP classes, the resources, the advocacy that a Hume, Falcon, and MLK have. I also had a single, a single sixth grade parent ask if we could add sixth grade to MLK. <laughs> And to be frank, it didn't dawn on me to bring a resolution because I, I know what that would do to McKissick. I know what it would do to any other school if that child lives outside of that cluster. And I've got to be mindful of all those things. So I love Legra. I, I'm sorry, I love Mrs. Newman. I, I appreciate the hard work she does. It, this, again, this is not a slight against her. And it doesn't matter the name of the school because I just told you that I'm not going to do it for the magnets either. But for me, it's all about the children who are the most disenfranchised. And yes, there, are other, there have been other points made that are very compelling around process and around the fiscal impact. But for now, uh, oh, and I, I do have to say this, when you, when you asked, when uh, Dr. Gentry asked about the number of students that would be accommodated, for me, it was important. It, for me, it would have mattered because I needed to know if it were that there were three students that felt like they didn't have somewhere to go. It's different from accommodating them versus just accommodating and developing an entirely new process for the sake of ideology. I mean, if we're going to be a student-focused district or a student-focused board, then for me, it's important to talk through how the students are impacted, but talk about how all students are impacted. I mean, it, and again, I appreciate and love the hard work that Purpose Prep does, and I appreciate even that they are willing to partner with schools and that they want to have conversations with families, but it's just so much bigger because I am the Pearl Cone parent. I, 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 know, I, I know what my neighbors face, and I know that I am in a very privileged position, not just being a board member, but all the different resources that I have access to. To call the question. Oh, okay. Well, we have a motion on the floor. We've had a second. All in favor? Please raise your hand. All opposed? All abstaining? All right, we have two abstentions. All right, motion fails. We will now move on to a resolution regarding physical, mental, and emotional support for all MNPS students, staff, parents, and other stakeholders, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. Mrs. Masters. Thank you. I'm taking a drink of water because it's long, and I won't, I won't give much of an introduction because I, I think, I hope it's all in the resolution. And uh, please know, Ms. Masters, that you certainly can read it all. You can also start at therefore, the, the resolving, so it's <laughs> totally up to you. Karen, <laughs> I'm a, I'll, I'll go fast. Okay. I promise. I really like it. And then do I make the motion after I read it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'll go fast. Okay. <clears throat> I won't even read the intro because Christian already said that part. Um, whereas it is the right of every child, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation to access a free public K-12 through education, and the district welcomes and supports all students 
And whereas the district has a responsibility to ensure that all students who reside within its boundaries, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation, can safely access a free public K through 12 education. And whereas the district recognizes that there are employees and educators who are gay, lesbian, and transgender, and that all employees are valued members of the school community, regardless of their gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. And whereas the district recognizes that there are families in our community of diverse background, and the district values all our families, regardless of the family member's gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation, and whereas Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Title VI prohibits discrimination, including discrimination based on gender, gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation, and whereas U.S. Department of Education has upheld the interpretation of Title IX to protect students from discrimination on the basis of their gender identity. And whereas on June 15, 2020, the United States Supreme Court ruled in the case of Bostock versus Clayton County that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity is necessarily also discrimination because of sex, as prohibited by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And whereas we recognize creating LGBTQIA plus inclusivity in Metro Nashville Public Schools is not about any single action, and it will not happen with just the passage of a resolution or the change of a policy, but it is about effectuating a paradigm shift through facilitating deeper understanding of sexual and gender diversity. And this requires appropriate communication, professional development, and a commitment from the board, the district, and all schools of all grade levels to support this shift and commit to moving forward with the resolve to learn and further best practices into the future. And whereas systemic transphobia, biphobia, and homophobia push LBTQIA plus youth out of school, and those same systems of oppression may cause long-lasting negative mental health outcomes. And whereas lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning LGBTQ students experience high rates of bullying, victimization, and harassment at school on the basis of their actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. And whereas this bullying, victimization, and harassment has led to negative educational outcomes for LGBTQ students, including higher rates of dropping out, higher absence rates, and lower post-secondary school aspirations. And whereas affirming gender identity and gender expression for youth of all ages is proven to be one of the most effective mental health interventions for supporting transgender youth, gender expansive youth, and gender nonconforming youth. And whereas MNPS board policy 5.500 prohibits employee harassment based upon sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or appearance, or sex, including sexual harassment. And whereas MMPS board policy 6.304 qualifies sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity expression among protected classes in the prohibition of bullying, discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and victimization of students. Therefore, be it resolved that the Metropolitan National Board of Education resolves to provide access to resources that are specifically responsive to gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. Furthermore, the district shall allow students and staff to use requested names and pronouns without requiring a legal name change or medical diagnosis. Furthermore, the district shall provide equal access to all resources and programs and ad advocate for access to district facilities that align with the students and staff members' gender expression. Furthermore, the district shall ensure that all administrators at all grade levels are aware of and capable of implementing all existing policies and tools, such as the MMPS gender support plan process in support of staff and students. Furthermore, the district shall continue to advocate for LGBTQ people and issues in school curricula and instructional materials, including in health and sex education, inclusive of materials that portray LGBTQ figures in a positive light. The district shall ensure that the curricula include diverse perspectives, especially LGBTQ people of color and issues specific to communities of color. 
Furthermore, the district shall distribute this resolution to district staff, students, and parents using usual means of communication, and the resolution will be translated into multiple languages spoken by students at home. Furthermore, district affiliated contractors having contact with MMPS students shall be notified of this resolution. I move that we accept this resolution to be approved as policy within MMPS, thereby showing our full and complete support of every student and every staff member and truly standing by our policy for every student to be known in MMPS. Second. Oh. I've called for a point of order. Thanks. I just ask you to clarify. So you put resolution and policy in the same sentence. It's not a policy. The resolution. Okay. So just that we're approving the resolution. As written. Um, as written. Okay. All right. Discussion? I just have a question. Is there anything that changes in policy or is there any kind of fiscal update that we need to be aware of? It's a... It, much of what is in the resolution is a restatement yeah. of existing policy. To my knowledge, this will be the first time that we as a board have actually voted on a resolution that states our support for LGBTQIA plus students and staff and faculty members. So it's very much a, um, a statement of our support of all students and staff. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, this is Player Peters. Oh, it's not a question. It's, just, it's not a question. It's a statement. It's just, I think it's very important, as I said, that we, we make sure that um, as a personal value and hope it's a value of the board is that, you know, there's dignity and respect for all parts of the MMPS family and that we're just affirming that dignity and respect that we create a safe place for learning and that I see this resolution as creating a safe space so children have an environment where they can receive education um, that is a place that's hopefully free from bullying and judgment. And I just want to thank you for bringing this and just to affirm um, that um, this is another aspect of diversity and that we need to be diverse in all levels and all measurements. And this is just one aspect of many types of diversity and that we affirm that. Uh, Mrs. Pupo Walker. Uh, I just want to say to all of our students and staff, um, whether they are they are LGBTQ or not, that we see you, we support you, we believe in you, we see value in what you hear. Um, the slate of hate that is moving through our legislature right now does not represent my values. I don't think it represents the majority of Tennesseans. Um, and I want to say it's not based on evidence, it's not based on data, it's not based on problems that exist. They are designed to um, <clears throat> satisfy a very fringe movement that is unfortunately happening, making as influential across uh, the country, not just in Tennessee. But this board um, will not sit by and just, and we want, we want our students and staff to know we stand with you. And I want to read a quote from Harvey Milk, who's a famous mm -hmm. um, gay advocate in San Francisco that died. Please try to remember that what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority, but to, to their inhumanity. So we are here to see you as full humans and part of our MNPS family. Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. I, um, of course, want to thank uh, Ms. Masters for her heavy work on creating the language and being very thoughtful with that language. Um, and I also really appreciate the community uh, the community advocacy that we've had. It has been really heartwarming and great to hear and see, particularly um, because of that slate of hate, as Ms. Pupa Walker discussed. Um, you are important to us, and you will continue to be important to us. And that is also known, and I want to make sure that we're aware that this also aligns with our every student known. And so this is a, I'm very thankful that you've done this, and I, I um, thank you. I just want to say uh, to that as well, and I promise I'll talk, Sharon, talk I'll stop talking, Sharon, I'm sorry. Keep going, girl. I'm just, just so excited ahead. to see you in that rainbow yeah, mask, girl. Else to go. <laughs> just here. Um, I just, 
the um, the outreach, a lot of which I know has has been spearheaded by MNEA. I'm so appreciative of that. I'm so appreciative of just all of the parents who have emailed to say, yay, we love this resolution. Let's do this. I, I have not received one single email um, or correspondence from anyone that um, saying anything negative about us taking this action. And it just means so much to me as a parent. Um, ah, shoot, I've got my <laughs> tissue. To know that um, this is where my children are going to school. And, um, and it just means a lot that everyone's wearing your rainbow mask that I kind of forced on you. Um, you didn't force us. I didn't. They wanted them. Um, so as a mom and as a board member, I am, I'm very proud of MMPS right now, even though I know we haven't voted yet. <laughs> all right. With that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, resolution passes unanimously. Thank you, Mrs. Woo! Master. All right, now we will move on um, on our agenda, agenda item number four, charter school applications for Aventura Community School and Nashville Classical School Two. We welcome the ever prepared Dr. Griffin. Good evening to Chair Bugs, to board members, Director Battle. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Charter School Review Team Findings for the new Charter School Applications for School Year 22-23. Just an overview of our, our department. No, I was with you a couple of weeks ago. Um, we monitor charter school compliance with laws, policies, and contractual obligations. We report charter school performance in academics, operations, and finance based on the SPF, or school performance framework. But our primary responsibility is to facilitate the authorization process by presenting the review team's evidenced findings to you, the board. As it relates to new applications, what we'll talk about tonight, renewal applications and amendments to existing applications. Currently, for the 2021 school year, there are 27 charter schools operating in MMPS. So let's talk a little bit about new applications. Remember, we are a compliance-driven department. And TCA-49-13116 is a state law that regulates and requires the Tennessee Department of Ed, you'll hear me say TDOE throughout the presentation, to provide a standard application format and a scoring criteria to address the elements in a charter school application. So our objective for this evening is for the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Public Education to consider the review team findings on the two applications for new charter schools and whether each should be approved or denied. State law requires each charter application must be considered and voted on separately. So our two 22-23 applicants for this year are a Ventura Community School, a new school application, and Nashville Classical Charter School II, a new school that is replicating an existing model. A little bit of an overview from our retreat as well. All applications are evaluated by the review team according to the overall capacity of the applicant in the following areas the quality of the academic plan, the quality of the financial management or business plan, and the quality of the operational plan. There are also three rating characteristics required by TCA, and they are meets the standard. This means that a response reflects a thorough understanding of the key issues and it aligned with the mission and vision. A partially meets standard, that's a response. We're in the criteria. It hits some aspects, 
but it may have lacked some details in others. And the third rating characteristic is does not meet standard. That standard means that the response in that section had substantial gaps in several areas. Now, just an example of our support hub. Our new application re review team for the school year 22-23 consisted of 15 reviewers. You can see all of the areas of expert expertise listed here, but we had 13 MNPS internal reviewers and two external reviewers that rounded out our 15. This review team reviewed both applications in the areas of their expertise listed. As we move forward on tonight, if the application is approved, MNPS and the applicant will enter into a chartering agreement. If the application is denied, the sponsor or applicant will have 30 days to resubmit an amended application to MNPS Office of Charter Schools. So let's talk about our first school. Our new start applicant, Aventura Community School, for the school year 22-23, they proposed a maximum enrollment of 930 students, grades K through eight. I'll ask board that you refer back to the one pager as I'm speaking about the rating characteristics that I shared with you on last Thursday, as well as the findings report. If we look at Aventura Community School, grades K-8, the academic plan, and as determined by the review team evidence findings, the rating is a partially meets standard. The evidence findings included, there was a lack of thorough current research that supports the curriculum and instructional strategies. The application also lacked detailed plans for meeting all student needs, including remediation, special education, and English language learners. I'm gonna to refer to your one pager for some additional evidence findings as it relates to the bullets that's on the slide. There was no data or research points provided that confirms that curriculum translated to Spanish improves outcomes for students. There was a lack of evidence in the application around the support of students who have a language background that is not English or Spanish speaking. The applicant did not address disproportionality and would need to hire their own school psychologist and not rely only on MENPS to identify students with disabilities. And finally, there was a lack of a plan for students who cannot be properly served by the inclusion model in the application to receive the appropriate adaptations and modifications. Again, these are evidence findings by the review team where Aventura Community School received in the academic plan section a rating of partially meets standard. As we move to the next section, I'll just call a Ventura Community School, ACS, K-8, for short, moving forward. The review team determined with the evidence findings that the operations plans had a rating of partially meets standard. The applicant, according to the evidence in the application, did not include a sound and reasonable plan for staffing that is likely to recruit dual certified teachers needed to staff the school. The applicant did not present a thorough and reasonable plan for start-up operations with specific details and exact time frames. The applicant identified a potential facility but does not currently have a proposed lease or a contract on a building. And finally, the applicant lacked an outlined solid transportation plan that is equitable to attract a diverse group of students. Going back to your one pager, in the operations section, I'll just call out a few um, detailed evidence findings as the review team reported them to us. The applicant described a timeline for startup tasks that is very vague and lacks specific details. More exact time frames are needed. A robust recruitment plan that supports the mission to recruit bilingual students was not found in the application. The applicant does not currently have a proposed lease or a contract on a building. 
The recruitment and professional development plan to find the number of dual certified teachers needed to run this charter successfully lacks detail and enough evidence that the plan will be successful. And finally, the applicant did not identify a transportation provider, so there is no way to confirm if their assumptions around bus transportation are accurate. There was no plan to address the need of families who opt to walk, drive, or drop off students. Again, this was determined by the review team in the evidence findings that the operations plan for ACS grades K-8 had a rating of partially meets standard. As we move to ACS K-8 in the financial plan, the rating was a meet standard. So there was evidence found by the review team that the applicant identified spending priorities that align with the school's mission, supports the academic plan, and supports the management structure. And the applicant also demonstrated financial planning and management capacity. Now this slide is not part of the standard application but for your information board, we wanted to provide the net fiscal impact at a maximum enrollment of 930 students. Of course, our finance team has confirmed this information, so I wanted to share with you that at a maximum enrollment of 930 students, it would be about a $4.6 million per year net fiscal impact. If you look on your one pager that we share with you Thursday, you can actually see the number of students that will be enrolled each year until it reaches maximum enrollment. So at this time, findings for the board consideration. After a thorough review of the application and based on the state evaluation rubric, the review team has determined the following for a Ventura Community School. Academics, a partially meets. Operations, partially meets, finances meets, and of course this is a new start applicant so there was no data for past performance and that's why you see NA. So Madam Chair, I'll now turn it over to you for the board's consideration. Thank you so much for that explanation, Dr. Griffin. And uh, again, for the viewing audience, for the community, during a recent board retreat, we had a great presentation from the charter office that is a whole three people deep. That means <laughs> all three people have worked diligently, very intentionally to make sure that we have as much information as possible to make the best decision for our students. So thank you for that overview. It really was helpful and informative. Now before we, be we begin discussion and motions, I want to remind everyone that there are students watching, that there are parents watching, that there are teachers watching from all of our schools. It is completely reasonable for us to ask questions, for us to try to convince one another to vote one way or the other, but please be mindful of the people that make up the schools. That's all I ask. With that in mind, uh, go ahead, if we have a motion, Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. I move um, that we deny the approval of a venture community school based upon them not meeting the academic or operational plans based upon a lack of evidence and thorough current research to support their curriculum um, about translating Spanish improves outcomes for all students, especially students that do not speak Spanish or English. Additionally, in provide, they do not provide appropriate RTI support or accountability along with um, assessing their global competence. There was additional lacked detailed plans for meeting all student needs, including remediation. Additionally, the applicant did not include the staffing plan that would be required to appropriately find as legally required SPED and EL students and does not currently have a secured facility nor an equitable transportation plan. Additionally, they have a vague teacher recruitment plan, though they will need dual certified teachers. Do we have a motion? I mean, I'm sorry, do we have a second? I'll second. All right, uh, Mrs. Tyler seconds. Any discussion? Mrs. Pupa Walker. Uh, thank you and to the team that did this review. So I'll, I'll just open by saying that I was a child who grew up in a household where Spanish was spoken, but I didn't learn to read and write it till I got to college. And then I taught native speakers of Spanish in metro schools who had to learn to read and write their first language. And so I believe in the mission and the purpose and the value that a school um, like Aventura would bring to Nashville. So I just have some questions for you or for your committee members. I don't know if they're here or not to answer questions. 
So it's not very common, in fact, unheard of for a charter applicant to have a contract on a facility before they're approved. Would you say that's true? Um, I mean, it's, my, not, it's unusual yes. for them to have a facility identified before they're approved. Um, I would not say it's unusual because it takes time to really prepare the school um, to be ready for the opening, and that's in 22-23, and it's yep. just a year away. I just think it's it's unrealistic for us to expect them to have a contract gotcha. if they haven't even been approved. So I think that's an unfair. Okay. Uh, I also really take um, uh, issue with the, the the language used here that um, curriculum translated into Spanish that there's no evidence that that improves outcomes for students. First of all, they're not translating; they're teaching in Spanish. They're not translating anything. They're tr teaching just like Glendale does. If there's no evidence that bilingual instruction works, why is Glendale one of the highest performing schools in our district? I mean, really. In most countries around the world, children learn two languages or more when they grow up. Um, we're one of those few countries that does not value second language acquisition in the early grades. And so I take issue with the idea that you can't and that there's no evidence. There's decades of research around teaching children in two languages from the earliest ages. So I, I think that's a flawed uh, sort of criticism of, of this application. I also don't understand why this school requires dual certified teachers when Glendale does not. And so I'd like to know what those two certifications would be in. Can anybody tell me what the dual certifications would be in? Well, because we had EL people a part of the review team, I will follow up on that because, again, I am reporting the findings from the review team, and so it is not fair for me to interject any of what they found yep. as reference in the document. So I cannot fairly yeah, respond I, I to that. I just think the idea that they need to be dual we'll certified Definitely. teaching in a bilingual school is not grounded in what we currently do. Gotcha. So that should not be held against them. Absolutely. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that you all said that, that there were no details on how they would monitor global confidence when on page 37 there's four different performance indicators with 14 unique measurable goals on global competence. So I urge these committees to come with accurate criticism of um, these applications because we don't typically take the time to go back and fact check. We are assuming that what we're getting is correct. So um, I'll just leave it there, but that's just, I would love to know the, what the dual certification requirement and why they're being dinged on that. Um, because I don't think you have to have EL endorsement <laughs> to be a bilingual teacher. Got it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll let the review team respond since we don't interject Absolutely. the findings of the application yes. um, on top of what the review team has already found. So I'll let the review team respond. Yes. Ms. Zilrod? <clears throat> Thank you. So I, I agree that there is research, for sure, of the benefits of having dual language. Um, my, my concern is that they were not able in the application to bring that evidence for themselves. Um, along with bringing the evidence that they understood how to identify legally as required uh, special ed students and English language students, though they are going to be a dual language school. So those, my concerns are that there's um, a lack of understanding of what they're, of how to uh, get to their goal. Um, and that Glendale, of course, obviously, is um, a well-respected school of doing the dual language and it already meets this need um, though it is a great need and has lots of evidence as suggested. I just um, say something real quick. So Glendale meets a need for white families in my district. Glendale doesn't meet a need for families whose children speak Spanish at home. And I think there's a really important distinction to be had there. Um, and I will also say the foot, that the application has a ton of references to research and evidence on the value of dual uh, language instruction. Um, I guess my argument back to that would be the implication there is in that the our individual public neighborhood schools are then not doing that job either. If Glendale is the only one that's able to meet our EL students' needs, then we are saying that none of our other schools are able to meet them, whether they're elementary school, middle school, or high school. And that's obviously not true. We have 
lots of schools that meet those needs, and not just Spanish speaking, but over 140 languages. So uh, uh, that is an, I understand the population at Glendale and how that is skewed. Um, this school um, claims to be filling a need that is wanted in the Overton cluster. Um, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the Glencliff cluster as I'm not tapped into that, uh, but the Overton cluster is my cluster, and there is not a big request for this type of school, nor is there a request for any additional K through 8 school in general. Um, there is and has been a want for an additional elementary school, which is being um, prioritized in next year's capital needs budget and ideally would be built in the next two to three years. And that, again, would be one of these K through five schools, which are what people are really looking for. And we're not looking for a few extra seats. In this district, we would need, and in my cluster, we would need a lot of extra seats, not a piecemeal solution to this. So there's not a huge need or advocacy for this school or this type of school. Um, Again, I find it really alarming that they did not understand uh, their legal requirements for the special needs students and the EL students, um, and that they um, missed that, particularly considering what their mission is. And operationally, I understand that they don't have a lease, but they don't have backup plans for their two current locations. And that also kind of speaks to not having a transportation plan and other operational needs that you would need to have in line for ideally um, kicking off in the next two years. I think it's worthwhile mentioning that um, this contract is for a K through eight school. Um, and they have on their board uh, Todd Dickinson, who's um, a co-creator, uh, founder, excuse me, of Valor, and well-known and respected. And Valor also originally started with a K through eight contract as well, but they only serve middle school and now high school as we've added extra seats. What could potentially keep this school from doing the same thing of not providing the elementary seats that are considered needed? Um, though once again, we don't really want them piecemealed, but what would keep them from only, what would keep them from not doing the same thing? Of only doing middle school and not the full K through eight? I don't think legally, I'm at, I'm at liberty to answer that okay. question. I'm gonna defer <laughs> to return to Roberta. Mm -hmm. Okay. I promise not to send you to jail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't wanna do that either. <laughs> so I haven't seen the Valor contract and how that was structured, so I don't know that I can comment and sort of comparing the two contracts. The way the contracts are typically written is that it talks, it lays out the progression for the schools. They will start in year one with X grade, start in year two. So I don't know what happened with Valor, but I would suspect that this contract for this particular school would be structured in that way. Okay. Um. I mean, my hope, of course, would be that it would be a K through eight school as um, in their contract. But of course, we understand elementary schools are more expensive and um, it, it's a concern as we, um, in response to the lack of elementary seats after that experience already significantly built up Norman Binkley, though it's not in my district, it's in Ms. Um, Frieda's district. I also wanna make sure, though I understand that it is a not uh, considered important by the state of Tennessee to talk about our fiscal impact of our schools. It is a responsibility and role of myself as a board member. And so I am not voting to deny this based upon the fiscal impact. As I have shared, there's a lot of other reasons that are within this um, compliance driven process. Um, I want to make sure I use your terms uh, that are good reasons and have good valid reasons, but fiscally it does not make sense for us either. Um, and so I want to make sure that we once again talk about, and I appreciate that being uh, provided, that it's the, uh, sorry, I have so many notes. It is the 4.6 million a year. And as that is increased with Enrollment, I average that out to it really be $32 million over the 10 year time. Um, so you're aware if it's 4.2 million a year, our current budget currently has paid family leave for our staff at 4 million and uh, the remaining full adoption of ELA materials, science, social studies, tech books, CTE and all these other things at 3.7 million. So there's a lot of ways that we could use this fiscal money in other ways. But again, within this compliance driven process, that is frankly leaned towards charter schools that's created by the state and through NASCA. 
they're still only meeting one of the three criteria and the other two are partially meets for this plethora of reasons. And so that is why my motion and why I will choose to deny. Mrs. Tyler? Um, I just, yeah, I'd like a little bit of clarification if it's possible. Um, the first thing is, what Could you is pull the, your mic just a little bit closer? Sorry, to um, I just a little bit of clarification if possible. What is their four point grading scale um, that you guys said it's, that there was concern that it was not aligned to the Tennessee State Board of Education policy or practice. So I just, I didn't know what they were gonna do, how they were gonna grade their students. Well, again, these are evidence findings from the review team. We can follow up with that because we have to really be factual about what the review team findings were. So we will actually follow up with that, what that four point scale okay. and what the review team evidenced. Okay. So. Um, and then I wanted to ask, and this might be a legal question for Melissa, but if for some reason both of the, the areas that they're hoping to place their school fall through um, and they are not able to open at the 22-23, right, um, school year, what does, what does that mean with our contract with them? The standard contract, then it could revoke the charter. Okay, and so if they do procure one of the spots, but they don't have it ready in time because it took a while. Is that similar language or different? I don't have the exact language in front of me, but usually there's a dialogue that okay. occurs once the application is approved there. They do work closely with the charter office. Okay. Um, I have a point of order, and this may be for Attorney Robert. Okay. May I? Go ahead. Uh, just trying to clarify timing for us because there seems to be a lot of questions. Um, and so where are we in that window before they default to something? So if no action is taken tonight, I believe that we would then exceed the window for considering it on the first pass. If the board votes to not approve tonight, they do have 30 days to address these partially meets categories and then it will come back before the board. Gotcha, okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Little. Yeah, and just adding on to what Dr. Gentry said, are, are we voting on it, although we're still asking the review team clarifying questions? You do need to have a vote tonight, yes. Okay. But will, if we don't have the clarifying questions answered by the review team that is independent and, uh, like, how can we know the best way to vote if we still have outstanding questions that were raised on the board floor? So if there are outstanding questions, again, you can vote no tonight, allow it to go back and have those 30 days for the charter school to submit additional information on partially meets, and Dr. Griffin and her team can provide the board with the requested information. L last question. Sure. <laughs> what if there are additional questions on the next vote? Will the review team be here to answer any questions? That way we don't have to vote on something that we still have clarifying questions. I can answer this one actually, Ms. Roberge, if you don't mind. Better. So what I would ask us to do is when we get those on that Thursday before the meeting, submit questions to Dr. Severe that way, and, and he can send the responses to the entire board. So we try. We have to have that five day, um, uh, the, the release of information at least five days before the board meeting, and that's to give us ample time to ask the questions and to reach out to staff to clarify. So if at that next time, if if by the if within the 30 days, if Aventura does not, or if we still have questions around the findings, go ahead and submit those questions to our to Dr. Severe. He'll funnel those to Dr. Griffin and to the team, and then be able to come back and not only respond to you, but be able to respond to all of us. And that's for anyone that has a questions or has a question. We'll be able to do it that way. Is that how we've always done this? Because it seems to me that, I mean, I didn't submit questions because I thought they would be answered tonight. To be honest, I, I think this is the first time that I've had, that we've had questions uh, from the, uh, about the review team's findings. I, I haven't seen this before either. No, that's not true. That's, we've, I've that's asked questions true. before. Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah, sure I've true. watched think, a lot of discussion. Point, <laughs> yeah, there's always been a lot of discussion. I think the difference <laughs> has been that the team has been available to support Whoever was presenting the findings, and so we she, um, Dr. Griffin, just does not have that support tonight, and so I think just procedurally, if I'm understanding correctly, and I know, I know, I think it's, it gives some people some discomfort to to write to not approve it because it says something, but it's it's not approving to give to allow the process to go forward. The process, of, we can't defer it. Okay. We have to take action. And so the action that we would take to get the additional information and allow the charters to 
close any gaps that were identified by the review team is to deny them so that they go back to the drawing board, fill in the gaps, and represent. In the meantime, as Chair Bucks has stated, any additional questions, let's get them documented to Dr. Severe so we'll have those answers plus the gaps filled in by the time it's presented again. And we can officially ask that they're here to support Dr. Griffin <laughs> so that if there are questions, again, to your point that night, they'll be here. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your expertise. All right, we'll go ahead. I'm gonna go. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well with that, we will vote. Uh, could you restate your motion? <laughs> oh, well, you know, just um, restate just, the first portion if you don't mind. It's already been documented. Okay, my motion is to deny a Ventura Community School. All right, and it was properly seconded. All in favor? All opposed? No abstentions, okay. So again, Dr. Griffin, to clarify, that means that Aventura will get notification that they have 30 days to 30 resubmit. To resubmit. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like we are requesting Dr. Battle yes. and Dr. Griffin that the, the entire team be here to be able to answer questions around any be, clarification, misgivings. So it. Go ahead, Ms., uh, Dr. Ginger. Yeah, I can see it all on her face. That's a pretty big team, right? 15 people. Yeah, so they may not all be here, <laughs> but I think if Dr. Severe can share the questions, uh -huh. if we can't get the answer back in writing, to have as many people as possible for those areas, because if I understand, I was at the retreat, mm -hmm. and I remember you said that there are people for each of those sections, so it's not everybody, we just need people for those sections where we need clarifying questions. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and one last question, does the operator, does the applicant, send in any responses to their application before you guys present? Like, did they send you anything that's clarifying or, or we just need to wait till they um, reapply if they were denied? According to Tennessee Code Annotated, the law states the only way that changes or amendments can be made is during the 30-day window. So we can't change, amend, consider, we have to follow the process, and that is 30 days after the vote, we receive amendments to the contracts. Yes, ma'am. So. And so we can't ask questions of the operator in this process beyond the interview no, thing I that y'all do? Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. Just in case my head shaking wasn't caught, um, <laughs> no. That's not part of the process. There is a capacity interview that Dr. Griffin had talked about, right. and that's their time to provide information for the board's consideration. <coughs> All right, and with that, we will move on to Nashville Classical School 2. Okay. And now to talk about our second application, Nashville Classical School 2, which is an existing operator in Tennessee, and they applied for a new school that replicates an existing model. Oh, I thought she voted. You did not vote. No, we did vote. We did vote. We're done. We voted. Yeah, oh. Yeah. Two it, was, it was eight oh, okay. to one. We just okay. didn't announce it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, new application for a school that replicates an existing model for the school year 22-23. Nashville Classical School 2, and I'll just call it NCS2 for short, has proposed a maximum of 600 students enrolled with grades K through eight. As determined by the review team and evidenced in the findings, NCS2 K-8 academic plan with the evidence findings received a rating of partially meets standard. The evidence findings detailed that the curriculum and instructional strategies align with the mission, target population, and state standards. However, the review team expressed concerns about the description of the rationale for selecting the community where the school will be located, as well as the applicant student recruitment plan. At this time, I'm going to ask the board to refer to your one-pager one more time, and I'll call out some specific examples as it relates to the partially meets standard rating. There was no detailed recruitment strategy for families already choosing other options in the proposed school area, so the review team was not confident that the enrollment trend in the current location 
would transfer to the new location. The review team was concerned that the applicant proposed and anticipated that the majority of families for the proposed school will come from clusters who are already experiencing enrollment challenges. The review team does acknowledge that the current Nashville Classical School reported that it has a wait list of students. However, no identified wait list was submitted in the application or during the capacity interview. The review team cannot ensure that the reported wait list will translate into enrolled seats at the proposed location, since the wait list is for students which are in another cluster. As evidenced by the fan, uh, findings, the review team deemed the academic plan as a partially meets standard. If we move to the operations plan for NCS2, the rating, according to the review team, was a meet standard. The review of the 2014 to 2019 operational framework found that Nashville Classical School, one, exceeded all organizational standards each year. The applicant art articulated clear roles and appropriate responsibilities for governance and management. The review team deemed the operations plan for NCS2 as a rating of meets standard. The financial plan. NCS2 K-8 financial plan, according to the review team and evidence findings, received a rating of meets standard. The applicant did identify financial procedures, policies, systems, and processes for accounting, payroll, and independent annual audits. And the applicant's budget narrative clearly explained and supported all revenue and cost assumptions. So the review team, according to evidence findings, rated NCS2 K-8 financial plan as a meet standard. If we move to past performance, remember this is a replication model, so they have past performance. The review team determined that NCS2 K-8 past performance was a rating of meet standard. The organization is currently in good standing and there have been no revocations, non-renewals, or financial organization or academic deficiencies. Again, the review team, as evidence findings reveal, rated NCS2 as a meet standard in past performance. Again, this is not part of the standard application. We wanted to provide this to you, the board, the net fiscal impact at maximum enrollment, which is 600 students. The net fiscal impact at maximum enrollment would be $2.6 million. If you turn on the back of that one pager that we provided for you on last week, you will see the actual number of students proposed per year as it relates to their enrollment at Nashville Classical II. And now the findings for board consideration. After a thorough review of the application and based on the state evaluation rubric, the review team has determined the following for Nashville Classical Charter School II, academics as partially meets, operations as meets, finances as meets, and past performance as meets. Madam Chair, I'll now turn it over to you for the board's consideration. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a motion, Ms. Tyler. Yes, um, you have to bear with me, it's kind of long, because okay. we have to say everything. <laughs> All right, um, I move to deny Nashville Classical's application for several reasons. First, their application does not describe a sound rationale for selecting the community where the school will locate. Nashville Public Schools is interested in charter, charter applicants who demonstrate the capacity to educate the most at-risk students in highly diverse and personalized settings. And according to Tennessee Code Annotated Law 4913106, public charter schools may be formed to provide quality educational options for students. The prospective student population shall be students who are assigned to or were previously enrolled in a school failing to make adequate yearly progress as defined by the state's accountability system, giving priority to at-risk students. Um, also, I kind of jump over one, and then students who in the previous school year failed to test proficient on the end of course assessments in language arts reading or mathematics. Students who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch and who are enrolled in LEAs that have an average daily membership of 14,000 students or more, and three or more schools 
that have missed the same benchmark for adequate yearly progress for two or more consecutive years, resulting in such schools being designated as high priority schools. So that's part of the code. I just kind of picked those pieces out. There, is, there are more designations within there. Um, so. Nashville Classical would like to open another school in District 9, in my district, but the district does not fit much of the criteria for prospective charter school students well. It's well known that families move into District 9 specifically for uh, their uh, children. I'm sorry, Ms. Tyler, was that still part of the motion? Oh, yeah, man, it's going okay, gotcha. in. Okay. <laughs> so can we just get your motion and then... That's still part of her motion. Motion? I mean, we have to have all the reasons in the motion. These are motion. my reasons. Yeah, I told y'all, you have to bear with me. <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> District 9, uh, families move to District 9 to attend the zoned elementary public schools specifically. These families are not going to choose to go to a charter school when they've moved for their public school. In addition to not having demand for a charter school, there is not a need for one in District 9. Not only do we not have, not only do we have the second smallest student population in all the districts, we also have the lowest number of economically disadvantaged students in the entire system. None of our schools have ever been on the priority school list. In fact, since the 2017-2018 school year, all of District 9 elementary schools have been designated reward schools at least once, if not more than once. All the TVOS scores for the elementary schools in District 9 meet or exceed Nashville Classical scores, with three of our five schools receiving the highest marks of five. Opening another school in District 9 would not put Nashville Classical in the community of students that they are bound to serve by state law. Additionally, the charter review team noted that the Hillwood cluster is currently serving 21 private schools that has an estimated 6,000 elementary and middle school students. Because there is not a robust detailed recru recruitment strategy for families already choosing private schools in the area, the review team is not confident that the enrollment trend in the current location will transfer over to the new location. And I just wanna note that when a charter school creates recruitment strategies for families already choosing private schools, they're not looking to recruit the most at-risk students. They are looking to recreate a private school using public dollars. Nashville Classical has suggested they plan to pull from not only District 9, but from the Whites Creek cluster as well. And Whites Creek has suffered from low student enrollment for many years, resulting in two school closures within the cluster. Pulling from Whites Creek may not be feasible due to the low numbers. Finally, whew, I have concerns about their ability to finance and complete any necessary renovations in the old Brookmead Elementary School before they plan to open. The school is over 60 years old, and the majority of it has not been renovated since its opening, and they've only added one addition a couple decades ago. I taught there right before it closed, and when I taught there over a decade ago, several rooms had recurring problems with mold because of the air conditioning system. I am hesitant to agree that the amount Nashville Classical has budgeted for, for facilities is appropriate without seeing an appraisal of what the old Brookmead would need to ensure a safe and healthy environment. Whew. We have a motion. Now, motion. do we have a second? <laughs> a second. All right, we have a second. Any, any discussion? All right, Mr. Little. So, one, um, my son is in the uh, sixth grade, and he attends Nashville Classical in, in East Nashville. So, just going back and forth with Melissa, since this is a, a different school, if I'd be voting, but I do want to give comment. I think for everything, when I listen to us talk about Aventura and then change the, the goalposts on highlighting that they partially meet academics and it was around the wait list, highlighting that they meet operations, highlighting that they meet finances, highlighting that they meet past performance, and then move the goalposts um, because we may not agree with the school coming to our community. For one, I think we have to look at academic achievement. When we look at the district as a whole, a lot of schools are not performing academically, and I think we talked about like there's been no real partnership, but this gives us the ability to have partnership. And I personally know, since my son is at the school, that Natural Classical has opened their doors to many of the schools in the area who have low performance so much, the door is so wide open that they have done dual PDs. And so I think we gotta take a step back and say, are we against every type of school because of its brand? 
are we looking at how they treat our kids academically and culturally? <laughs> and I would say in the motion that sounded, it was a lot from an old state law um, that's not as current as the one you were reading. And that was for Ms. Tyler. All right, Dr. Gentry and then Ms. Tyler. So what I, I would just like to point out a couple of things, and I said this in the response to the <laughs> resolution that was um, presented earlier. This process for approving, and, and is even as Ms. Player Peters pointed out that it was rigid, it's very outlined, it's very detailed, it's very clear on the, the boxes that need to be checked, this can become a very black and white process that does not relieve us of the responsibility of being strategic about approving charters. And so it, it can also be argued that you know, we, that, that you, it's like um, you tell me I'm racist, and so anything I say, you're going to categorize it as racist. You can't tell us that we're, you know, we can't make the statement that we're against charter schools because we're trying to be strategic about the ones we approve. And so there, there, if there, just as, the, uh, as part of Ms. Elred's comment, there was not a demand for the school, as far as she was aware, the people who are pushing for Nashville Classical are in, currently have children enrolled in East Nashville, where there are priority schools, where there is a demand for an alternative educational option for their schools. Ms. Tyler is telling us that that doesn't exist. So I don't think she's honing in on the brand. I think she's honing in on, is it a need? And again, if we, we are attempting, I believe, to go back to the original intent of charters to fill a void that the district at the present time is not capable of meeting. That void, according to the data, does not exist in the current district where they're proposing to establish the school. Now, let's go to the point that they wanna pull students from the Whites Creek cluster. Here comes Sharon. We got enough problems. <laughs> Again, mm -hmm. we've already pointed out that we've had to make some very hard decisions because of low capacity. We've also pointed out that we are making changes. We, have, we, can't, we, we sit here as a board and approve plans to improve our schools and then support and, and then have discussions or consider supporting decisions that undermine those plans that we've approved. And I, and I, just, I struggle to say I've charged my one employee from moving mountains in District 1, from moving mountains in Pearl Cone. This is what I've asked her to do. This is what has, we've been approved. This is what we're gonna evaluate. This is what her, we talked about livelihood earlier. Her livelihood is dependent upon her ability to be successful in moving the district schools forward. And her ability to do that is directly contingent upon the number of resources, i.e. dollars, that she has available to do that. And I, I, I struggle with being, you know, and it's almost like uh, I'm, I, we're trying to be shamed because people want to throw up. I've gotten texts even sitting here. You didn't talk about the students. Again, I got one employee and her, she is charged with making a difference for the students in this district. The schools, the student, and she can only do that directly for the students that are in the district schools. And she needs resources and our support to do that. So my vote, and I, and I, I am not going to accept being accused of being anti-charter or anti-anything. What I am is pro-MNPS district schools because that's the board I serve on. What I am <laughs> is for supporting and providing the resources necessary for our one employee to be, to have a, it's no more fucking chance in hell to have a chance <laughs> to be successful. And again, I, 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 I applaud, we have, and to say, again, we already got 27 charter schools. So for, to even suggest that there is an anti-charter mentality in this district is crazy. There isn't. We have charter schools here. We, 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 we collaborate when it's possible. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to accept that. That, that dialogue to be a part of the narrative that goes forward about this board. But what I want us to understand is that we, we, we can't talk out of both sides of our neck. We can't 
say we want all these things done for MNPS district schools and then make decisions that make it difficult for those things to be accomplished. And that's just where I struggle. It's not about whether it's a truck. If, 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 if Dr. Battle came and said, we're going to open up a whole new school in District 9. I said, why? Why? Tell me why. We wouldn't do it because there's not a need for a new school in District 9. And again, she says, well, I mean, well, <laughs> other than the billion dollar one we've already proved. Uh, <laughs> that one. <laughs> That's an infrastructure thing. Um, and so I, I, just, I just struggle with sometimes our lens being a bit skewed um, when, we are, when we're making decisions. And so I, I, you know, I don't know, yeah, all of that. All right, Mrs. Tyler, then Mrs. Elrod. Um, well, I want to second everything that Dr. Gentry just said. Um, I'm fully on board with that. And I, I also want to point out that the academic program design and capacity rating includes capacity. So where it is located is part of the reason why you would approve or deny. And I have shown, and I can give you more numbers if you want them, District 9 does not want a charter school. They will not attend. And so capacity will be a problem. And that's part of the academic program design and capacity. And that has nothing to do with whether or not your school is good. Because I hear that it's just knocking it out of the park where it's located. In District 9, it would not be serving the same group of students with the same needs. And I love that they open the doors to the priority schools around them to do PD with, the, with our zone schools. I think that's wonderful. Um, but we don't have any priority schools in District 9. We have reward schools in District 9. So I just, it, it's not about, as Dr. Gentry said, it's, it's not about being anti all charter. This is about looking at what it is supposed to do and recognizing when it is not going to meet that standard. Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, um, to reiterate some points. Um, as was said, it's not needed in that district. And um, that's particularly confusing as they have no detailed recruitment strategy, but claim that the majority of their students are going to be from within that district. Um, and so if they don't have a way of figuring out how to recruit from private schools, um, which kudos to them if they can figure that out. Um, then that's concerning because I don't know how they're planning on filling the seats that are needed. And to that point, I know that we've discussed in some detail, a, a bunch of us have discussed um, the importance of doing things for all of our students and the, the push that we give to Dr. Battle and the team and to each other to do what's best for most. And doing what's best for most in a strategic vision is one thing, doing what might be easier or feel better for 600 students is another story. Um, again, because you know I'm going to talk about the fiscal impact, though I understand that that is not within our compliance-driven structure. Um, it is uh, $19.4 million over 10 years when you annualize it among all their enrollment. And again, that does not meet our strategic vision or our role and responsibilities as a board of figuring out how we're supposed to be best supporting our students that we currently have. And once again, not a, not a small group of students that don't currently need to be served as they are already well, more than well supported. Mr. Little? <coughs> Mr. Little? Yeah, this is a good conversation. And I'm well versed in, in grassroots and <coughs> my tenure on the board, I'm, I'm learning grass tops. And, and I would say in grassroots, when I talk to parents all around, all around the city, you know, Antioch, Bellevue, East Nashville, North Nashville, it, it's not about the location of the school. Um, and so even when we look at District 9 and the private schools, I think we're challenging their ability to recruit private schools, but we're also not thinking about parents who are willing to drive from Antioch to MLK every day. And so the location of the school for me doesn't matter. And, and maybe that's where we philosophically disagree. I think the academic achievement, when I think about when a, when a student leaves the third grade, 
not reading on the third grade level, and then you reassess a kid in the eighth grade, and not only have they, they have not remained the same, but they have gotten a little bit worse. I think those are the conversations I'm willing to have, and I, and I understand as a board, and you know, I, I, I listen to you guys, I take note, but for me, my direction is not about what's good for a system, but what is good for our students. And, and I, I think we're gonna continue to disagree. I think Rachel Elrod does a really good job of breaking things down on like what she feels is right and what's wrong. And so as I was listening to her, I just, I was saying, oh, like now we're, we're moving the goalposts um, because from our reviewers who have gone through this whole process have come back with favorable results. And now that they have come back with favorable results, we say that's, that's, that's not enough. And I just think, as Dr. Gentry said, well, she didn't say, but she talked about black and white. We can do this process in black and white, but at the end of the day, her job is to support the school board. I think we got to support our families. And so why do we need Antioch parents driving to MLK? But when we created MLK, it was a structure to bring back the white flight that had left our schools. And so when you look at Megs, when you look at MLK, and when you look at um, Hume Fog, all of those were African-American schools. Um, and so we created a strategy to bring it back. And so we got to think about what is our strategy to really educate kids? Because I'm going to tell you right now, and there's no disrespect, and so I'm going to just say this and I'm going to be quiet. I wholeheartedly support Dr. Battle. This is not going to be like a us versus them. This is, I look at her staff. Um, I look at how she moves. I look at this process here, and it is A+. Plus. My, my allegiance is not to people. It's to the kids. And as my pastor would always say at the end, I only came for one. You know, I didn't, you know, he didn't give his sermon to make sure everybody got baptized in the church. He just came for that one, that one parishioner who listened to the sermon, who felt convicted in their heart to get baptized. And as we think about education in Nashville, as someone who grew up in the system, I think we got to think deeply about it. I think we got to lay it out on the line. I think the equity roadmap is an opportunity, but as we look at these schools and we look at National Classical, I think they've been a good partner and they deserve the respect um, outside of the budget um, talk. I think they deserve the respect because they have taken the least of them and educated those kids. It's referenced in everywhere that they do on their wait list, which they actually go through the district and their wait list is very robust. And, and as they have consistently partnered with many of us up here to talk about the great things that they're doing. And that'll be my end, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was speaking in Ms. Elrod and then Mrs. Bush. So that was a great segue because I was actually going to offer some historical context. In 1963, Metro Nashville Public Schools became, or MN, uh, Metro became a, an, um, a metropolitan government. MNPS became, or began to become integrated. And that's when, at that point, I think we had 90,000 students. We have not recovered from integration. It was 100,000. Everyone, I, I've been called a race baiter before, but I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that the public education system is still a public system that was steeped in racism, classism. So yes, in 1963, we experienced some white flight. We built magnet schools. I say all that to say that there is a, certainly an argument to make sure that we um, elevate our thinking, that we better support families, that we, you know, we began offering options to try to recruit white families back to Nashville public schools to ask them to integrate with their neighbors and actually care about black people. And then that became, well, can you care about brown people? And then that became, well, can you care about differently abled people? And so slowly but surely, we've been trying to become a public system that is way more diverse, not just in the students that we serve, but in the way that we serve them. I offer all of this context to say that is why I cannot and will not vote for this, because when I was speaking to the, the, the charter leader, who I have a lot of respect for and who I appreciate, we went back and forth quite a bit today um, with some healthy debate. I do not appreciate that African-American students are asked to move from their neighborhoods to be bused across the city to force diversity on other neighborhoods. I don't like that. When I was in high school, I went to MLK. And I remember my little sister was about to, you know, she was entering into middle school and my parents were having to decide whether she was gonna go to White's Creek or just what school she was gonna attend. And that's when we were rezoned to Hillwood. Now, if you know where my parents live, it's in Bordeaux, like kind of deep in Bordeaux. So the idea that my little sister would have had to be on a bus for 45 minutes to get to Hillwood to help force 
diversity on them because she was a black girl and they needed black people in their schools was frustrating. It's even more frustrating now. And I, I, I certainly don't believe that Nashville Classical means to be, right. um, to, to fluster in that way or to, to they, they mean to be a good actor. They are trying to help diversity. But I frankly do not believe that if we bus black kids out of their neighborhoods, that that will recruit private school parents who have already decided that they don't want their kids with our kids. And you can take that how you like with the us and the, the, the they and the hour, but it's just, it's, it's a fact. If that is gonna be the recruitment strategy, we won't recruit private school families back to, to MNPS. We won't recruit them back to that Hillwood cluster. It'll just further exacerbate race relations because now my baby has to feel like their neighborhood, their school is not where the best can happen. They need to go somewhere else to get it. They have to be around white neighbors to get something, to get resources and that, I need to remove my emotion, but it just frustrates me because it is so representative of larger issues. But that's what I take issue with. It's, it's not that I am anti-charter or that I don't like Nashville Classical. Shoot, last year I fought. I fought at this table to increase their enrollment. I fought for that because I did appreciate what they were doing. I do see them as partners and collaborators. But what I will not do is try to force even more families who have the means to, to drive across the city. And I won't force students who don't have the means to be bused across the city. They're, they're, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit flustered and I'm trying to bring myself back, but it just, we can never focus on the students in the most under-resourced neighborhoods and the most under-resourced communities and schools. We cannot resource them if we always, always, always do what Nashville does. And Nashville keeps trying to support the most affluent families in our community. We ignore those who will never speak up. We ignore those who don't have a pathway to us. We ignore those who don't know who their elected officials are to reach out and advocate to them. Why do we do that? Heaven forbid we pour our resources, our time, and our energy into a Buena Vista, into a McKissick, into a Pearl Cone. Why? Why do we have to continue to, to I, it, it, I, I can't, I'm not articulating it well, but to continue to ask our most dis disenfranchised families to bear the burden of diversifying communities and schools is infuriating. Again, I separate that from Nashville Classical because I know that's not what they're trying to do. They are trying to offer an option. I just at this time don't believe that that is what we need to do. We already have limited dollars. And I, I say that not to, to ring the money bell, but to suggest the idea that we will never have enough resources to appropriately provide education for students at Warner. Again, Warner is a blue ribbon school that everyone is, is, is choosing with their feet not to attend. We'll never have the resources to make sure that a pearl cone has the teachers, the training, the fields that they need, the other things that other schools already have with PTO dollars or with parent advocacy. If we continue to only care about those families who know how to approach us and advocate to us, all of our kids will never benefit. It will continue to separate us further. We'll separate the haves from the have nots. <coughs> Mrs. Elrod. Okay. Um, so I want to respond to uh, Mr. Little's consideration that families will drive from Antioch and other clusters. It's important to state that within these conversations we're having about strategy and where they partially meet their academics is because they themselves don't believe that. Um, and they should know. I mean, they're the operator and not only the operator of one school that's considered good, they're, they have an aggressive growth plan. And they themselves say, if you read the, the paperwork, that they expect them to come from the Hillwood cluster as a majority and then come from White's Creek clusters, which we have heard and we should know that that's not a place to uh, recruit students from, as we have had to make the very difficult decision to close schools in that area. And then from there, they might go to Pearl Cone and Glencliff. So it, they're not, uh, that's not their goal, is to have a bunch of students drive in. And so um, they, they should know what their, their market is, and it appears that they don't, and that's part of the reason why they got the partially meets. And so to that other point of I'm moving the goalpost, the goalpost is, is that they have to meet 
the requirements of in this application. Um, we are a compliance-driven group of people. Um, now, I have made my points pretty clear in the past of that I think the application is not as robust as it should be by the state, um, but that we move, if you are not able to meet the criteria of a rubric that is already leaned in your favor, that is very concerning. And if you still don't know where your students are gonna come from, and we're saying that it's not needed in that district, just like it was said about the other school, though that's not what we're discussing now, um, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably agree that it's not needed in that area. Um, I mean, to this point, we say that they've met their operational needs, but within this notes, if we read them, it talks about operationally, about how they're planning on tripling their school and student population in two years and how that's concerning. Now, that is a concern. We wanna make sure that they're able to do that so that they are not languishing. Um, and the only way that they're gonna be able to do that is once again, if they understand and know their market and they have an appropriate passage to it. And so I think that this is a valuable conversation, um, not only for our strategic conversations about what they're wanting to do, but also about what our goals are, and of course the continuation and the support, both with our current resources and hopefully additional financial resources for our other schools that we currently already have. And Christian is gone, and so I think, Fran, you are next. <laughs> I just have a question, Melissa. I, I okay, so, I'm going to um, vote to deny, um, so I'll let y'all know I'm going to do that up front. Um, and I've listened to everyone, and y'all know how I am when it comes to um, being very, uh, I listen a lot, and I, I do my research. Um, and I'm too a little concerned about how, um, and I think Nashville Classical does a great job. I'm not saying that. It's just the way they're pulling the population of our students to be able to meet those um, the, dem the demographic that they're looking for to be to make this school successful, and I've heard um, Ms. Tyler's concerns and in her district, and I've looked at her district. I've been able to analyze what's in her district, and she at this time the district doesn't have a need. Um, they are doing really well over in her district, um, but my concern is with the state because it looks upon that if we are going to deny because partially or partly because of location, how does that look on a state level? Um, does it look like, okay, well, yeah, we know that her district may not, or based on the information that's been presented, how does that look upon the state? So I'd always hate to try to predict elected officials' uh, minds or any decision makers' mind, um, but that being said, I would want to wait until next board meeting to see what the rationale is for either approving or denying before making a comment on what the state may or may not do. Okay, so in other words, so in 30 days, they have an opportunity to come back. And because they've heard our discussion, will that be an opportunity or will they consider, and I can't say what's in their heads, to consider a different district to look upon going to, to <coughs> satisfy what we're, or what are asked or what we're stating as a board or I just kind of want to, I mean, I've not seen this before, so I just kind of want to get some feedback. That would be an entirely new application for a school in a different okay. place. Their application here would address the recruitment concerns that are found under the partially meets standard. Okay. Okay. That's what I worry about. I just worry about kind of how that's going to work out, if they're going to be looking at a different location. But like you said, it's a different application, right? Okay. Thank you. This is Player Peters and then Ms. Tyler. Um, I would like to suggest as a board at our next retreat, we have a more thoughtful and full-throated conversations about the charter. Because I think a lot of things that happen is separate from the specific charter application. Some of the things that Dr. Gentry said, um, I think needs to be discussed because um, this is before your time on the board, Mr. Little, but there was a, a foundation set amongst board members of how we would consider and think about um, charter schools and charter applications. Unfortunately, like me, <laughs> you came through <laughs> an appointment process, and so you missed some of those conversations just by the virtue of, you know, of, um, of a vacancy. But I think we need to have that discussion because I think that's a different discussion because um, you said about not being good for the system, but by default, 
this national charter school is creating their own system. It's a mini system because their goals is to, um, to they have one school, they're asking for another, and they plan to ask for a third. So by default of what they're doing, they're creating a system. So we can't use the, the parent um, desires as a mean of motivation um, for this for this because they are creating a system also. And by default, we are a system. I mean, it's one of the things of we have to govern like a system. And even though there's grassroots and grass tops, like you said, but we're here to govern. We have a mission and a role is to provide oversight of what public school needs and what the community wants. That's literally in our mission. And that's the difficult part of this job is to do that. Um, I am not anti-charter. Um, I voted for the expansion of charters against some of my um, supporters um, that thought that I should not do that. Um, but that's the role that I took and the, the position that I took. So I think we have to be very careful of the narrative that we set because we're educating kids. And educating kids, I wish, as you know, as budget and finance chair, we had unlimited money and we can print money and pull money, then that wouldn't have been an issue. But we do have finite resources. Um, but that's a different discussion. That has nothing to do with this. But we have to be thoughtful and strategic. And that's a different conversation of how charters fit within the entire MSPS system and how we interact with one another. And I think we can't confuse that relationship or goal with individual charter applications. So I just hope that the next time we have a retreat, that we make space to have this conversation. Because I think we're conflating what we do with a district and a, and then and and we're having discussions during individual school application. And I think they're two different discussions. So I would love to have that discussion with you. I hope we have that discussion. We did not have it the last board retreat when we we're going over this. I think that was probably an appropriate time to really have that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully, as a board floor, I'm asking my fellow colleagues at the next board retreat that we have this discussion of the role of charters, their place, and how they fit in the MMPS system and how that relationship works. Because this is a different conversation. It's not fair to Dr. Griffin. It's not fair to review board to have that overarching conversation in the middle of an individual conversation. And it's not fair to that charter application. It's not fair to them to talk about branding and things like that. When, right. For me, I don't, care, well, I don't care about brand. It's about governing. It's about a system, what resources can be provided, and how we can provide it. Um, and I think that's a different discussion. And I do not want to confuse that with an individual aspect. I, I'm sorry, hold on. Um, I, I appreciate you calling that out. And I, I do on Nashville Classical uh, an apology. My, my passion was not geared toward you all, toward the students, or towards the school. It, I, I feel like I was triggered by this whole idea of we're not focusing on students when we talk about all students in the system. And that just, that, that bothers me. So I, I did not mean, it just, it, it's something that I wish as a community, as just as people, that we would be more mindful of how all students are impacted, how their SEL needs are not met by certain assumptions that we force on them. And, and to your point, Mrs. Player Peters, I refuse to vote to add another magnet school to our portfolio. I refuse. I'm, I have Hume Fogg and MLK and NSA all in my district. I'm asked at least monthly about adding another school or, or turning a school into a magnet. And no, no. Why would we? We have so many other students, so many other schools that need that attention, that reimagined ed, that focus, um, that, that type of work. And so it's, for me, it's not at all about the name of the school. It's that we have, we already are tasked with meeting the needs of students that come into first grade, 30% of students coming into first grade already one grade level behind. We can't even have high level conversations about how to best support families before they get to us or how to resource them once they do get there, you know, because we spend a lot of time talking about other kind of tangential issues. But all right, uh, Ms. Tyler and then Mr. Little. Um, thank you. Yes, I just I, I was going to kind of echo say similar things actually to what you said, Ms. Player Peters. So I don't want to repeat you too much, but I, I do want to um, kind of reiterate that idea that you know you're not on the board of Nashville Classical, you're on the board of MMPS, and so yeah, we need to think about MMPS students and not just the specific kids whose families advocate for them. Not the kids who have the transportation. Not the kids whose parents are willing to put their baby kindergartner on a school bus to, I mean, on a city bus to drive them across town to get to a, a spot. But every single kid 
the ones whose parents are not involved, the ones whose parents do not want them to go somewhere else because it is too inconvenient for the three jobs that they're working and they have to keep them there. That we have to make sure that we are funding and supporting the schools that support every single student in Metro, period and not opening up avenues for only certain groups to leave. I'm sorry, Mr. Little. Abigail Tyler, I love you for that. <laughs> know where I come from and my background and my understanding of systems in this community that I'm not advocating for National Classical. I'm on this board. And, and we should have a conversation about all the conversations I have in the McGavitt cluster about helping all students, because I think sometimes you can push a narrative and don't understand the background on everything that we do when we say all students. <coughs> when we talk about academic achievement, and when you look at something, I looked at, I think it's Charlotte Park, it's 10% ELA, so out of 100 students, if we're talking about students, Jason, Sandy, Jeanette, we're talking about real people, only 10% of those students are reading, on, well, 10.9, so let's say 11%. When we look at the school to prison pipeline, when we look at Nashville, when we look at 37208, we have had an issue for, for generations, for generations, um, and it's been very intentional, and so my fight it's not for a school. It's, it's to break a system that we have been educated in for us to rethink and reimagine how we do school for our kids. Because right now, when I do step into different communities, and I know District 1, I can be in District 1. I can be in McGavick. I mean, I love people like I love you. And so I'm going to continue to fight not for systems, but for people, because that's the only way we win. So we have had a school system all across the country, just not Nashville, whether it's Oakland, Memphis, New Orleans, like we have had a problem with education. Maybe it's because of charter schools, maybe it's just because we haven't done it right, because public education has been around for generations. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not gonna get a chance to vote. I'm gonna take the advice of, of the attorney. But I, I do wanna say, we gotta support kids and we gotta take our blinders off about what the budget looks like because at the end of the day, I can bring a bunch of people here who have gone through our public education system who can't read, like still to this day. So they can't read, their kids can't read. And I'm, and I'm talking to these parents every single day. And if you guys wanna, I guess, check my resume, like I can set you up with these interviews. We had an interview yesterday with Anna Thorson and so many parents were on there. This makes sense. They had an eye opening moment. And so when I talk about going into the community to do these district meetings, it's because we need to see the people we serve. It's going to be very inconvenient. It may even cost a little money. But if we're talking about budget, when they when they see you and they know that you care, they work harder. When they don't think you care, it's just uh, they graduate high school not knowing how to read. And, and that's what we've been dealing with. And I, I can't vote. And I said I don't want to make us go long, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go give me some water. But I do want to listen if someone has specific responses for me. We have uh, Mrs. Pupo Walker, Mrs. Player Peters, Dr. Gentry. Oh, wow. Yeah. Go get okay. a snack. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is this specific for me? I gotta go. You see should that. stay just for, okay, the, okay. In, for the moment, for the entirety of this experience. So, well, my first question is a, a, is a technical question for um, Ms. Roberge. <laughs> so, the law that is cited in the motion is not the current law. The current law right. is we are an open enrollment state. And so it, if we're saying that the, we're making an argument based on that they're not meeting this kind of set of criteria of why we would approve, I just think we have to be thoughtful about that's not going to hold water right. at the state board because we're an open enrollment. We haven't, I mean, it doesn't, we, they can open whenever they want. Any charter can open wherever they want. They don't have to serve any particular population. So I'm just saying um, for purposes of the motion, it might not serve us well if this were to pass, that that is the basis of the motion. Okay. I want to start there. Um, and then I, I will say, I'll speak to this like history of thoughtful deliberation about charters on this board. And prior to my coming on, I served, as some of you know, and have heard me say this, I served as a charter review lead. I did the job of 
leading a group of 13, 14 people through this process, including Valor. We turned down two thirds. We approved a third. That's why we have a strong charter sector here. And there were times where we said, okay, we're gonna make a rule, and so we're only gonna approve charters that are gonna open in crowded neighborhoods where there's crowded schools. Well, we didn't stick to that maybe for a year. I mean, we let a school open in the McAdams cluster, right? So we we have not got a track record of saying we're gonna uh, we're gonna set some criteria and we're gonna approve schools based on this criteria because we have people. Let's be really honest, who will never vote to approve a charter school, right? No matter what the criteria. And so I think we have to. It's disingenuous to say we're gonna have a set of criteria that if we don't actually believe that we're gonna follow through on that. Because then what happens is charters apply based on our criteria and we still turn them down. And so I just think we have to be really thoughtful about, and when I ran for the seat, I, you know, obviously we all ran and the big question is, how do you feel about charter schools, right? And so my thing is, our job is to be good stewards of this district and a good governance and, and including the money, but also to say, are students excelling? Are students succeeding? Are we meeting benchmarks on all of these things? And we are not, right? For many, many, majority of kids in this district, we are not. And so until we are, we're going to continue to get charter schools that are going to come here and outperform us. And so I don't know whether National Classical can convince 600 people or whatever it is to come to that school. Maybe they can. Um, but until we can get our performance where we want, want it to be, where, even where they are, we're going to continue to get these applications. So we have to be really thoughtful about what are we going to do about that? Are we going to actually increase achievement for students? I mean, that's on every single one of us. That's the big rock we are carrying in our backpack every day. And so I just think we have to be really honest. If we're going to set out a say, statement of principles about what charters and how charters are approved, then let's be really honest about that, right? And so. Um, we're, uh, uh, anyway, I think that's all I'm going to say. I, I will say this has been a really good discussion. I've been very, I'm very, I respect everybody here and your position and your thoughtfulness and your, I, I have to tell you, it's a hard call for me. Yeah. Because I know, I know, I've done parent engagement at Charlotte Park Elementary. Latino parents are not being served well at Charlotte Park Elementary School. Fact. Okay? And so we have kids languishing in EL over there for too long. Right, we have that. We see that at Old at Cockrell. We see that at Park Avenue. We see it, and let's be honest: those families are going to shop, and if it's not to a National Classical, it's probably going to be somewhere else. So we have to be honest: Are we actually doing what we need to be doing? Yeah, the Gower families are not going to go to National Classical, probably, or Westmead families, but. Uh, I don't know about folks over there on, on Charlotte Avenue. I just don't. And so when I have Latino families come to me and say, should I go here or go here? And I'm apples to apples, it's a hard call. And so, uh, I mean, I'm, John and I have been in this work sort of at different, you know, different points along the continuum, but it's a hard one when you have a school that is put in front of a family that is way outperforming your neighborhood school. And so I, I just, I'm just going to leave that there. This has been a hard one for me. I actually don't know. It's the <coughs> second helmet of vote. That's where I am. So, okay. Mrs. Player Peters and then Dr. Gentry. Yeah, and I guess this one's because I wasn't trying to say we set criteria. I know that was a discussion of a past board, but just about the philosophy. I think a lot of assumptions have made where we are as a board about the philosophy of charters. And I think that discussion needs to be fleshed out amongst us outside of a specific charter application. So that's the point I was really want to get to because I don't want assumptions to be made um, of how we view charters when it's individual it takes one application at a time, but then also how it works within our system. And I think the, that's an overarching conversation that's not specific about how we approve or not approve charters. The other part is going back to the system part. Sorry, that's my thing, you know. But when you break a system, there's repercussions to that, and what do you rebuild? If you go to the civil rights movement, they were breaking a system that did not serve to the voting rights 
So you broke the system, but then you repair a system with this piece of legislation that reinforce the system that you want. And so I agree, like we should not be doing the things the same way, but if you break a system, you have to replace it with some type of infrastructure or you will have chaos. And that's the part of, we do have financial repercussions. Because there was a charter transfer, we had to transfer and make budget cuts among ourselves. That's a holistic conversation that's separate and apart from this application. So we can't say financial aspects as a matter. We can't say that for specific, specific applications, but there has to at least be a discussion that there are effects of to what we do, what we do, and effects of a system. That's part of the system. You do one thing to another, there is an equal and opposite reflect somewhere else. And so should financial impact should be the sole, sole aspect? Absolutely not. But there still has to be discussion of what are we building for? What are we transforming for? That's even, if you go to the basic, my view of the philosophy of charters, they want to break a system to create another system. So a system has been created. There's a system of 27 charters that's outside of ours. So there's still a system aspect that has to be as part of a general conversation. And so that's the part I just want to do that we need to save for a retreat conversation and not this conversation. All right, Dr. Gingery. A million other things I could say, but I'd like to call for a point of order to get us back to the vote. Yeah, I, want, I need to amend, don't I? Yeah, so yeah. I, my point of order is to end the discussion that's not directly related to the application that's before us and then to call the question. Um, can, I, um, can I make a motion to amend? I think maybe with where we are, um, because to motion to amend, I think you would have to restate your entire motion and then amend it. So let's maybe stick with your current motion um, and take a vote on that and then see where we are. If the charter school is denied, we will have 30 days, come back, and then we will talk about uh, how to formulate the next motion. Point of information. We should withdraw the, the motion and we, rest and we state it. Withdraw it. Without, without saying it. You can withdraw the motion. Okay, um, I withdraw my motion and then. We just need to get the inappropriate language off. The yes, yeah. yes. So I withdraw. And now I need to make a new motion and restate everything without it, right? I'll let David. No. Oh, never mind. He said no. <laughs> <laughs> so for this motion, again, because we have this 30 days, it could be motion to deny based on it being partially meets and we will reevaluate in 30 days. So just more, much more condensed mm -hmm. and that doesn't limit the board at the next meeting for the reasoning, um, but it does streamline this process tonight. Okay. At the next meeting, she can say all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what she, she's in the same position. Yeah, we can talk about it, yes. Yeah. Okay, well then I move to deny Nashville Classical's application because they, does, it does not describe a sound rationale for selecting the community where the school will locate. It only has partially meets for the academics, and I have concerns about their ability to finance <coughs> and complete necessary renovations on the old Brookmead Elementary School before they plan to open. All right, do I have a second? So, uh, can I have a question? So we're voting on because of that criteria? Because of that motion? Yes. If we vote it's yes, number. it's because we, ab we agree with that? Is that what I'm doing? Yes. So we have a motion, but do we you have want me to go through the whole thing no, again? No, I'm just, I can. I'm just I can make it point by point. I can, you know, you just tell me. Do we have a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? All right, one abstention. We'll go to announcements. Uh, the meeting, I mean, the motion has failed. So, Dr. Griffin and Charter School Office, if you all don't mind, please just let us know next steps within the next 30 days. And I'm sure you'll be following up with Mr. Friedman and the Nashville Classical family. Absolutely. Our next steps is to notify each of the board's uh, decision on April 28th, which is tomorrow. We'll all make right. sure we do that. Thank you so much for thank that. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Aventura Community School family and to the Nashville Classical family for 
submitting your applications. Since you all have both been denied, you'll have a 30-day time period to amend your application. With that in mind, we'll move on to announcements. Dr. Gentry. This is Poopa Walker. Okay. I want to say congratulations to valedictorian Rose Tidwell and salutatorian Charlie Eichmann from Hillsborough for their um, hard work to get to this point. Congratulations. Uh, we need more students applying for student board member of the board. We have five applications. Uh, one is from a traditional <coughs> zoned high school. FYI. Um, Thanks to Council Member Angie Henderson and the Nashville Tree Foundation for spearheading a tree planting of 35 trees on April 10th at Julia Green uh, at the Walking Path and Playground. And then a big thank you to District 8 retiring teachers Beverly Bryant from JT Moore, Frances Mazur from Julia Green, and Lisa Trujillo from Percy Priest Elementary. All right, Mrs. Bush. Yes, real quick, I just want to um, acknowledge all of our teachers who are retiring and want to thank them for investing in our students. And I pray, pray, pray they get some rest and, uh, and have many, many blessings. And just thank you for your service um, in our district. Thank you. Mr. Little. I'll echo what everyone said about the retirement. Also, we just had our community meeting in District 4 this past Saturday, talked about some really good issues, working with the McGavick um, PTO in the near future um, to work on some initiatives that they deem important. Um, it's Teacher Appreciation Week coming up, um, and I've been reached out by the staff at Two Rivers to help show some appreciation to teachers and students who have had just a tumultuous year. Ms. Zellrod. Thank you. Um, first, the School of Science and Math at Vanderbilt, which partners with us at MMPS, has had a record-breaking number of applications, and they've emailed everyone that applied, and they will announce the next class mid-May after our seniors celebrate their graduation, which by our seniors, it's the seniors of that group. Um, and if you've never taken the time as a board member to go and visit that, though, of course, they've not allowed that during our COVID procedures. But when they reopen, I highly suggest you go over there. It's really very interesting, and it's a very unique program that we should be very proud of to offer here at MMPS and have students involved in. It's exceptional. Um, and lastly, um, I, I just want to thank the staff at Overton. Um, Dr. Battle did a wonderful job of acknowledging um, the tremendous work that was done there. And they are an incredible school filled with very passionate and dedicated teachers, incredible families, and that was really shown by their quick ability to react and support each other and support their students, particularly in such a time of crisis. And I really appreciate not only the response of Overton, but the response of the Overton cluster. It has been so nice to hear from our cluster um, groups and community members that have been so appreciative of knowing what the supports were that were there, whether they came from the support hub, I use the right terms, um, <laughs> or whether it came from within Overton themselves. Um, many thanks, of course, to those individual teachers. And of course, Dr. Pittman, I appreciated speaking to her on uh, Saturday about the experience and just checking in and making sure everyone was okay and getting some rest. But um, Again, I appreciate everyone's help and support there. Uh, if you want to help or support additionally, uh, there are some neighborhood groups that I'm working with that are thinking about providing uh, breakfast and some additional snacks over there to help support not only the exceptional year they've had, but of course also last week. And on that note, I wanna thank the Predators who are providing uh, a pizza lunch this week for the same reason. Mrs. Poopa Walker. The other P. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is Player Peters. Y'all look um, so much alike. <laughs> right here. Right here. Right here. That's right here. <laughs> Soul sisters right here. Um, so I'd like to congratulate um, um, Mr. Baskin, um, uh, Ms. Dees, uh, Ms. Foreman, uh, Ms. Maximowitz, um, Ms. Mitchell, and uh, Ms. Sanders for their retirements. Thank you for your service. 
um, and thank you for serving our children. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the um, the event that happened today with Dr. Battle with the um, and her staff. Um, if you get a chance to, if you can go see the artwork, it's phenomenal. I wish I could buy copies of the prints um, of the, the artwork that I can't believe these are high school students doing this level of work. And then also just um, even our own conference room, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a beauty of what a can of paint could do. So, um, you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of money on the renovations, but, you know, we're very efficient and a can of paint can go a long way. <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, with that um, and that where we are reimagining re what we're doing with Metro Schools and what you've done in this short year has been amazing and a phenomenal that you'll be able to turn this around in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> in the middle of economic crisis, in the middle of governing what we have governed, the fact that you'll be able to do something proactive and positive is reassuring and thank you to the team. I know you didn't do it by yourself, um, that who executed that vision to say thank you to that. So I greatly um, appreciate that and um, just thank you for our colleagues for a spirit discussion today and hope we can continue this into the future. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Masters. Thank you. Um, I just, I want to um, once again congratulate Maplewood's, uh, Maplewood Air Force Junior ROTC. Um, so they won the 1920 um, Air Force JROTC Distinguished Unit Award. It only went to 387 units um, nationwide. So uh, it's a huge honor. And the reason I'm bringing it up again is because our wonderful District 8 Councilperson, Nancy Van Rees, presented them with a proclamation that was written this past May. Um, uh, just, was that yesterday or the day before? It was yesterday. Today's Tuesday. I don't know. All the days are running together. Um, and I was really honored to be there as she read that and um, just to be able to experience that and see those um, really outstanding students. Um, and they, they escorted me from my car. It was so fancy. It was, I loved it. I <laughs> um, also want to um, give a little shout out to the um, Faculty Advisory Council at Dan Mills Elementary School. Um, one of the um, communities there that's zoned for Dan Mills, um, Berkeley Hills, uh, there's some virtual students there. They were concerned they weren't getting enough books. And so I'm going to put this on my Instagram because they built this beautiful um, little library and filled it with books for them so so that the students would have plenty of access to books. Um, so I thought that was pretty exciting. I um, also want to give a shout out to Kevin Walker, who is our vice chair of our PAC, who is, stayed for the entire meeting again today. I mean, and, and I, I just, I love that because as we're doing this work with the Parent Advisory Council, it's as important that we understand where the parents are coming from as, as that they then are able to, to sort of represent and speak to what's happening at board meetings. So I really appreciate you you being here and sticking it out with us. Um, and then last but not least, once again, I wanna, the student board member applications, um, I've been sending them to principals. I've been putting them on my Instagram. I've had a couple questions from teens about them via direct message on Instagram. Hopefully those are, those are coming your way. God love for us to just get a ton of applications for that and be able to pick two really wonderful student colleagues to be on the board with us. And I'm just really excited. I think it was a good night. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Mrs. Tyler. Um, I, I want to take a moment and congratulate our retiring teachers as well. Um, I actually have taught with several of them in my district, and I'm just, we'll, we will be sad to see you go. And thank you for your years of experience and time and love. And then I also want to take a moment and recognize that um, Miss Denise Holland, who was a bus driver for the Hillwood Cluster, unexpectedly passed away last week. And I just want to take a moment to recognize her. She was so well loved. I watched as the news came across on social media where families were saying, we loved her. That's Miss Denise. How, what are we going to do? And she was very well loved and very well respected. And we will miss her a lot. Thank you. Um, one last thing from Ms. Elrod. 
Thank you. I forgot to mention, and I think it's maybe nice to state um, on the note of people that are no longer with us, it's so nice to see the support hub and all the additional artwork. And I just want to make sure that we just, I just wanted to throw it out there that uh, our past chair, Anna Shepard, would have so loved it. Um, and so it is really nice and it, it helps me remember her as well. So thank you so much for everyone's additional work. And um, we really appreciate it. Uh, on a bit of a somber note, our condolences, our hearts go out to the Harper family as we recently lost pioneer politician, grassroots, grass tops activist, Senator Thelma Harper. I think she was the first African-American female politician I ever knew, and she was certainly the first female African-American uh, senator in, in Tennessee. She, I'm not going to cry because I'm already just flustered emotionally, but she was, she was just amazing. She was amazing, and um, she will be missed. Her family has already lost a lot, and so we just we send our, our thoughts and our prayers to her, her daughter and um, nieces, nephews, and extended family. I want to reiterate that if you have not heard, Warner Steam Elementary School is a blue ribbon school. So much I could say about Warner and the hard work, but I will just say this one thing. Um, when passionate leadership, when uh, intentional education and, and training, and when increased dollars all meet, student outcomes increase. That influction of MSAP dollars from a few years ago, that, what, million dollars a year that went into not only renovating the spaces, but allowing Warner to reimagine how they supported the, their diverse population of students has certainly helped. We could not have done this without the parents and families and certainly the educators at Warner. So congratulations to them. Um, very recently, unfortunately the same day as another, um, as something else happening in MNPS, uh, prolific prophet uh, Percy Miller and his son, who will soon be attending Tennessee State University, visited McKissick Middle School. Um, if you're not familiar with Percy Miller, AKA Master P, he is partnering with Tennessee State University and by default will be partnering with McKissick. And it has not really gotten the recognition in the community that it deserved, but he was there to speak to the to McKissick Middle School students. I was so impressed. I was outside there with my, my own son because I had to get a picture, but um, the, the questions from those young people, McKissick is, off, is a school that in the community is often overlooked, but those, it, those babies re-inspired me. I was able to see middle school students that I had not, you know, I haven't seen students in at least a year and being able to be out there with them and, and hear and understand what their questions and what their thoughts were and how they were motivated in some way was really nice. Uh, again, student board members, we cannot wait to have you up here to have your, your voice. Um, the mayor's state of Metro will be this Thursday. It is, it will be at 10.30 a.m. at the Music City Center. We'll hear um, just an update about all things Nashville, all things metropolitan government. So if you can't be there, please just tune in. It's really important. We're really excited to continue to partner with Mayor Cooper. We thank him for the ways that he has continued to support us. So looking forward to hearing what happens there and then uh, looking to you, Mrs. Player Peters, about what that means for our budget advocacy. 10 ready. I know this has been um, a bit of a source of frustration or even confusion in some families or uh, with our students, but thank you educators for continuing to work through this, in, <laughs> this international pandemic to make sure that students have been educated but also have been assessed so that we can give them appropriate feedback. Thank you students and families for tapping in in whatever way that you did. I have to give a special shout out to Stratford High School that had 90% of its freshman class come in to get tested. That's another school that has been under-enrolled under-resourced. Parents have unfortunately chosen with their feet not to attend, even though great things are happening. So we'll continue to appreciate Stratford and elevate them and schools like them. But be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.